Good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to the Scottish Members' Day. Whether you're joining us from one of our three branches or further afield, as always, we're so pleased that you could join us. It's certainly been very wet and blustery here in the borders this week, but I hope you've managed to enjoy some autumn butterflies and moths. Even though it's late in the year, there's still lots to see and do, and I'm sure we're going to be hearing today about activities that you can get involved with. We have a great lineup of speakers, but as usual, I do have a few notices to get through before we get started. The first and absolutely most important thing that I need to do is to say a huge thank you to our wonderful office manager, Shona Gregg, who's leaving us after nearly 20 years with Butterfly Conservation. Now, I know that lots of you will be really sad to see Shona go. She's often the first point of contact for volunteers and has very much been the glue that holds us all together. She was certainly the first BC staff member that I ever met. I remember nearly 10 years ago now, I was so nervous to attend my first Battleby meeting, but it was such a relief to have a friendly and smiley person like Shona come to collect a few of us from Perth train station. As well as organizing our Battleby gatherings, Shona has also secured vital funds for some of our most successful projects, like the Bog Squad and Helping Hands for Butterflies. I'm sure that you will all join me in wishing Shona all the success and happiness for her future and to thank her for her dedication to BC. So thank you, Shona. My next exciting announcement is that Species on the Edge, our huge collaborative Scotland-wide project is finally starting in the new year. So thanks to David Hill and the rest of the team working hard behind the scenes, this project will hopefully make a difference to some of Scotland's most threatened coastal species. Now, the reason I'm highlighting this today is because BC Scotland are actually advertising for two new project officers. So one post will be based in Argyle, leading on marsh fertility and slender scotch burnet conservation. And the second post will be um, based in Inverness, working on small blue and northern brown argus. Now, here's the really important part. We would like lots of lovely applicants for these positions. So please help us to spread the word through your networks. I'll be posting the link um, in the chat in a minute at the side. And we'd hugely appreciate if you could check it out and pass it on. Next up, uh, the strategy. Now, no doubt many of you will be aware that BC launched a new 2026 strategy earlier this year. And I do wish that I had further updates for you today. However, I want to let you know that we are making good progress behind the scenes. Branch committee members are currently taking part in three workshops around each of the three goals, which focus on threatened species, priority landscapes, and engaging the public. This is an opportunity for branch committees to really have an input and decide with staff what the strategy will look like in their branch area. So whilst I can't give you more details at the moment, do look out for information coming soon from your local branch committee. One aspect of the strategy that you can get involved with today, though, is our wild spaces theme. We have a very ambitious goal to create 100,000 wild spaces for butterflies. So if you have plans to create habitat for butterflies in your garden or local community, you can actually register your, your intention to do this on our website. And again, I'll put the link in the chat box in a minute and it'd be really helpful if you could get involved. So you'll be pleased to hear that I'm on my, my last update for the day, um, and it's a great one to end on. So please join me in congratulating Barry Prater on being awarded an Outstanding Volunteer Award by Butterfly Conservation. Barry served as the chair of East Branch for many years and has led some truly outstanding work in the south of Scotland on Northern Brown Argus conservation. So well done, Barry. We're delighted that your efforts have been recognised. Now, just a quick reminder that this is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you. If you would like to ask any questions to our guest speakers today, 
please enter it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and any general chit chat can go in the chat box at the side. So our first guest needs no introduction. Most of you will know Paul Kirkland from his time as Butterfly Conservation's Head of Scotland, but today he's going to be talking about his upcoming book. Thanks very much, uh, Apithany, and thanks everybody. It's very nice to be invited to uh, give this talk. Um, I think it's billed as a keynote talk, but I'm not gonna say anything really profound, I'm afraid, or, or even, new it's uh well it's a shameless plug for my book really but anyway uh let's just carry on and see what you think of it so discovering scotland's butterflies uh why the title discovering scotland's butterflies well at one level uh we're all discovering things about scotland's butterflies aren't we particularly where they are what the trends are but uh in my mind when i got the title uh agreed uh, it was really sort of pitching it at people who didn't really know much about butterflies in Scotland or butterflies at all, really. It's really uh, one of the aims of the book is to try and get more people interested in butterflies and thus discovering the delights of butterflies themselves. Um, another sort of less important reason is really to reveal the uh, importance, I think, and, and the, the uh well, the value of, of Scotland's butterflies to those who, who are familiar with butterflies in other parts of the UK. So this was uh, an early draft of the cover by uh, Peter Eels, very kindly did that. Okay, well, first, uh, really, I need to thank everybody who's contributed to the book. Uh, it was a, a real, it's a collaboration, really, and uh, it's involved more than 20 photographers, more than 30 people have provided anecdotes and little snippets. Uh, we've got some poems, some original artwork, and also a big vote of thanks to the publishers, Nature Bureau, and to uh, Alan Kay, who, who did the proofreading, which turned out to be essential and almost, uh, well, embarrassing at times. Okay, but more than that, and of course, what we always have to do is, is thank you, really, the volunteers, who put in so much time and effort to record butterflies, to turn people onto butterflies, to help them identify butterflies, to train them in more specialised sort of techniques of, of habitat classification or e ecology or looking for particular life stages. All of you who do the survey and monitoring. And of course, a lot of you are involved in campaigning and lobbying and uh, uh, there's uh, uh, a couple of volunteers lobbying the guy in the white shirt from Nature Scott. But often you need a little bit of staff help, don't you? And there's our lovely David Hill just getting a little bit feisty uh, with some heavy duty lobbying there. Um, so what is the book about? Well, in a way, it's easier to say what it isn't about, really, if that makes sense. So a few of you will know of the uh, wonderful book by uh, George Thompson, The Butterflies of Scotland, produced in 1980, which uh, really has still got a huge amount of valuable information in. Sadly, it's out of print and hard to come by and quite expensive probably in second-hand bookshops. But uh, really, uh, th this my book is, is really in no way an attempt to emulate or update what George did. George's book is still very, uh, very useful. Um, it's not really an identification guide. It's not a guide to sort of really take out into the field. Of course, you could take it out into the field and use it for identification, but that's not its primary intention either. And there, nowadays with phones uh, and websites and Facebook, it's much easier in a way to take pictures and, and post them and people will identify them for you if you're not sure. And then of course, there's our own, uh, or Butterfly Conservation Scotland's own regional free leaflets uh, covering identification. Um, it's not even a proper traditional sort of atlas, a dot atlas with dotty maps. Um, I know we love these dotty maps, but uh, sometimes uh, they can be a little bit misleading. Uh, and the distribution of Scotland is changing so fast for many species that they're out of date as soon as they're published. So uh, there are other ways, I think, of, uh, of um, really showing exactly in more detail where, where species occur and where they don't occur. And we'll, Get onto that a little bit later. Um, the 
book, my book uh, really drew on three fantastic sources of information. George Thompson's book already mentioned, but the wonderful uh, and very readable book by Jeremy Thomas and Richard Lewington, Butterflies of Britain and Ireland. That's, that's really got so much fascinating information in. And then the newer book by Peter Eales, The Wonderful uh, Life Cycles, and what's showing all the life stages of British butterflies and Irish butterflies has really been a very useful source of information for this book. So what the book is the book really about? Well, it's obviously, as any book on butterflies would aim to do, it gives some basic information, identification, ecology, and distribution. It talks a bit about Scotland's habitats. Um, not everyone is familiar with the whole range of Scotland's habitats. And it talks uh, a bit about um, how to record and conservation uh, as it is just in, in Scotland. And of course, it looks ahead to changes um, in distribution uh, and our butterfly fauna and, and has suggestions on how to get involved and how to help. But mostly, again, as I say, it's really the book is aimed to try and get more people interested in butterflies more people watching butterflies, learning about them, enjoying them, and ultimately uh, recording them. So because of it, that, that it's aimed at people who don't know a huge amount about butterflies, there are some basic uh, sections on, on basic you know, butterfly biology uh, and behavior, stuff that I'm sure most of you looking will, will know more than me, certainly. Um, but some, some basic information, it's surprising how how many uh, professionals I came across, conservation professionals, didn't really understand the life cycle of butterflies or at least the, the variety of life cycles of butterflies. So just some very basic information. As I say, it'll cover the sort of range, the immense range of habitats in Scotland that butterflies use, you know, from the uh, wonderful mountain tops to the wonderful brownfield sites and the coasts and the rivers and the wetlands and the forests. Quite briefly, but uh, just to give people a flavour of where, where 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 they can expect to see butterflies and what sort of butterflies they might expect to see. It covers the early years of butterflies in Scotland, uh, the first colonisers. Um, some of you will be able to identify this uh, uh, butterfly over here. Um, some of you might not. Uh, in fact. It is a so-called Aaron Brown uh, photograph is from Bulgaria. So it covers a little bit about the sort of quirks of early butterfly recording in Scotland. Um, a bit about butterfly names uh, and that wide variety of butterflies. Uh, many uh, butterflies have been given subspecific names in Scotland and some of these seem to be quite valid and others perhaps uh, we might be more skeptical about. Uh, we talk about recording again and citizen science and conservation, as I mentioned, uh, how to record different life stages and um, some of the conservation uh, projects and activities that have gone on before. Of course, it covers the, the various species to be found in Scotland. And it's uh, even though we haven't got too many species in Scotland, it's a little bit tricky to decide what species do occur in Scotland. and. Uh, I decided quite arbitrarily to include the Essex skipper, but not the brimstone, but maybe uh, that's uh, a mistake. And, and already we've got uh, pretty well good evidence that brimstone occurs in Scotland, but whether that's been officially sanctioned, I don't know. Anyway, 36 species accounts covering uh, some sort of fast facts, basic stuff, which you'll all know, I'm sure most of you, uh, and an indicative map. Um, based on, on what's available publicly, um, but particularly the wonderful uh, East Branch uh, maps, which is so useful with a, a little bit of tweaking with the help from one or two very keen volunteers who had more up-to-date information. Pages on description, uh, distribution, ecology, behavior, trends where we know them, but uh, those of you who are reading the book and, those, and a lot of you already realize that and know that a lot of the trends are, are quite, uh, unclear for Scotland's butterflies because of uh, the difficulties in recording. Uh, and a little bit of section on, on where to see butterflies if, they're, if they've got restricted distribution. Um, 
as I mentioned, we got some live stage pictures from uh, lent to us from by the wonderful Peter Eels, and pictures of males and females where they're different, where it's important to show the the differences. And and a really nice uh, part of the book, I think, is is these anecdotes from from you, some of you, uh, very kindly supplied anecdotes, just to show the sort of pleasure and fun of recording butterflies. And we've also got some poems from a guy called Stuart Graham, who's a very keen lepidopterist uh, based in Dumfries. And he was very keen to contribute a few poems, which just add a little bit of variety to the uh, text, break it up a bit. Of course, we've got to talk about some of the uh, rarities, the two rare visitors which are seen from time to time, and well, Beauty and Monarch. Um, but it's very, very unlikely they'll ever become resident in Scotland. Um, that picture of the monarch, by the way, was taken in Shetland by a guy called Dan Brown a couple of years ago. Now, uh, I know uh, most of you are probably rather more keen on moths than butterflies, and that's fine. So I did include a little bit on day flying moths. Again, it's really aimed at people new to butterflies. They're bound to see day flying moths if they're looking for butterflies. And this is just a short section in the book, just covering some of the more spectacular and colorful and common day flying moths they might, they might see. So um, some sort of themes to me came out of the book while I was writing it, researching it. Um, some of these themes you'll all know back to front, basically, but others I think perhaps need a bit more of a, of a high profile. So we've got relatively few species in Scotland, a butterfly, but well, have we got an awful lot of variation, varieties, local forms, subspecies, whatever you want to call them? Uh, are these well documented? Are, are they well recorded? Perhaps they were more documented in the past when we had expert naturalists come up from the south, find these strange looking butterflies and give them subspecific names. Uh, to us, they're just what we see as per normal, but uh, they're the part of the variety of Scottish butterflies. Islands. Islands uh, are very important um, because they're, they're sort of isolated habitats. And we talk a lot in butterfly conservation terms about isolated habitats these days, isolated by hostile land use. But islands obviously are very isolated when you come to butterflies. But they're terribly under-recorded. And we could do with an awful lot more recording on the islands. Uh, okay, we've got a, a cool, damp climate. And reading through the text of my book, I, I probably mentioned the cool, damp climate too many times. I'm sorry about that, in a way. You've always had a, a lovely summer this year. But even though the climate is generally rather cool, we obviously got these very warm microhabitats that allow heat-demanding species to thrive. And it's always a bit of a surprise, isn't it, that butterflies that really need hot microclimates do so well in Scotland. Uh, these butterflies are doing so well in Scotland because, as you all know, our habitats are much more extensive, better connected than most of the rest of the UK and, and often a better quality. Trends, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the dark about trends for many species, even some of our most cherished species. Um, the Scottish checkered skipper or the Atlantic checkered skipper, depending on how you want to, to call it. Uh, is it, uh, as in the new red list for butterflies in the UK, uh, of least concern, or is it uh, a conservation priority A, which is in the BC conservation strategy? There's a little bit of a difference there, and it comes down to uh, us not really knowing enough about it, uh, its trends. Few species have been studied in Scotland. It's a great shame. Most of the research on butterflies has been done down south. Whether that applies to Scottish butterflies, we don't know until the work is done up here. Uh, one or two people have done some research up here, particularly on mountain ring, that, that's great. But we need more research for those of you who want to spend a little bit more time and get really get stuck in. And climate change, that's the big topic, isn't it, really? We're going to get more species. We have got had more species, but is it going to result in fewer butterflies? 
only time will tell. So, yes, well, we could get more species, couldn't we? As I mentioned, brimstone may be already resident in uh, East Lothian, the borders. Um, has it arrived here naturally? We don't know. There could be releases. But uh, people are encouraging it by planting buckthorn, which is great because it is a species which has got the ability to move north, provided the food plant and habitat is there for it. What other species might arrive soon? Well, there was a sighting of high-brown fertility a couple of years ago in Dumfries and Galloway, Galloway not too far from its uh, hot spot in, in Rana Morecambe Bay in Cumbria. Uh, another butterfly of the Morecambe Bay hot spot is the Duke of Burgundy. And there are possible records of Duke of Burgundy from Scotland, although it's never been definitively proved, but there are certainly references to Duke of Burgundy in George Thompson's book, in, again, in Dumfries and Galloway. It's not doing terribly well in England, so uh, maybe one day if it ever reaches Scotland, it might do better. Gatekeeper, or the, or the hedge brown, also known as the hedge brown, is very close to Scotland, but it's been very close for quite a number of years now. I remember in Cumbria, it was up as far north as St Bees, and it hasn't really moved much further north in, in the last 20 plus years. But it's on its way, it must be on its way, maybe it will come up the east coast more quickly. Uh, and the brown argus, well, that's going to present us with some problems, isn't it, if that arrives? That's motoring up from England and, uh, well, who knows what happens when that meets the northern brown argus. But, well, we might get more species, but could we get fewer butterflies? And there's an awful lot of evidence now and, and headlines about insect declines around the world, insect declines obviously in the UK and northern Europe. Uh, without doubt, insects have declined across the countryside, but the speed and rate is, is up for debate. Uh, the main causes, you will know them extremely well, habitat loss, invasive species, pollution has become more uh, of a focus in recent years, particularly in the UK, but even more so in, in parts of Northern Europe, Netherlands and Belgium where nitrogen pollution is really causing serious problems for a number of butterfly species. And it could well be causing the same problems here, but there's been less research done. That, by the way, is um, this picture is uh, rhododendron invading marsh fertility habitat on Isla. Rhododendron is a well-known invasive species. It's not just invading woodlands and, and moorland, it's also invading blanket bog and other habitats. So a number of problems out there, which again, you're all very familiar with. But climate change is, is uh, say, the hot topic, so to speak. And we're doing quite well, aren't we? It's uh, warmer weather, milder winters, more butterflies. People get orange tips in their gardens now and the commas motored up the East Coast and it's slowly spreading up the West. Holly blue is really taken off this year in the last couple of years, particularly in the Southeast. Uh, and the small skipper has really uh, sped up at a rate of knots, between four and six kilometres a, a year, really moving very fast. Presumably all these are, are spreading in relation to climate change because there's plenty of habitat for them to colonise and spread into. But it's not quite uh, straightforward at times, is it, really? So uh, the marsh artillery and purple hair streak we've recorded uh, spreading distribution in the last few years, but is this a real spread or is it a better recording? It's again, a little bit of a, a debate going on there. Uh, marsh artillery is quite a, an elusive species and are hard to detect at times, but purple hair streak, once you're looking in the right place at the right time, which is fairly easy to see. But uh, Chris Stamp and others have been leading a, a lot of work in the last couple of years to uh, monitor its, its range spread as they would have it, or possibly uh, it hasn't been detected there where they're now finding it. Large skipper, unlike its smaller cousin, has been moving northwards, but very slowly. Again, there seems to be plenty of habitat for the species. It just likes long grass, uh, a little bit of shelter. But why is it spreading so slowly? So we're not too sure really, and. and it would be great to get more research done on these species. 
the ringer has spread very fast in Scotland. I think we all know that. But then again, it's a species of cool, damp habitats. That's the sort of classic description of it. And we see it still flying in sort of dismal, dreek weather. Um, and it certainly suffers very badly in, when you get droughts. Like in 1976, it crashed in England and whether it'll crash next year. So it's, it's a bit confusing, isn't it, that a, a butterfly that seems to like damp, cool habitats is doing so well, presumably in relation to climate change. More research needed. It's a climate crisis, really, isn't it? Uh, and many species are not responding as we would expect to a warmer, milder climate. Small copper should be romping away. Plenty of plenty of sorrel out there in the countryside, but uh, really, it's 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 sort of declining, and really, you never see very many of them. Uh, the grayling, again, a species of hot habitats, hot dry habitats, but really is declining in Scotland and, and elsewhere in Northern Europe and maybe climate link to nitrogen pollution is the answer, but I think the jury is still out. And the same applies to the wall. Why isn't it doing better? It seems to be doing okay in Southern Scotland at the moment, but in England, most of you will know, it's really suffered a massive decline. Small tortoiseshell suffered a massive decline. And again, we don't really know why, but it seems to be recovering a little bit in England, but whether that decline is sort of on its way in Scotland or whether we're going to miss it, we don't know. A climate catastrophe is what we're facing, perhaps. Our lovely northern species that are adapted to cool, damp climates, how are they going to survive when the climate uh, warms up by two degrees? The bogs dry out, uh, their habitats dry out, or their even the rock rose starts to curl up its toes because its uh, habitats have become too dry and droughted. Uh, are we going to lose these species? And of course, uh, this is uh, a bad news for these lovely butterflies, but uh, it's uh, bad news for all wildlife and all life on planet Earth. Enough of the despondency, how you can help we can all do a little bit to help butterflies. Again, this is really aimed at people new to butterflies in a way. Um, and one of the first and most obvious issues we can help with is, is growing plants for butterflies, nectar plants, food plants. And that's, uh, it's been a, a topic for many, many years, as you can see by that uh, wonderful book, Creative Butterfly Garden, which is my 1969 copy uh, bought when I was a nipper. Um, in the summer, obviously, uh, we get a wealth of butterflies in our gardens after our buddleias, verbena, hemp agrimony. But don't forget the springtime when we get the butterflies and bees out looking for dandelions. So uh, please encourage dandelions in your lawns and wherever else you might uh, think that they can grow. So uh, for those of you who are keen gardeners, of course, but please don't use peat because... Uh, this is what happens to peat bogs when they're mined or harvested, as some people would say, for peat. Rye flat lanark and lethem polkirk. I don't think we can call it rye flat moss and lethem moss anymore. Of course, we're all about recording, or very much about recording in butterfly conservation. And targeted recording, such as, as I mentioned, has been done recently called Double Hair Street, Hair Street by Chris Stamp and East Branch and others has been a fantastic uh, success. So targeted recording species that uh, may or may not be declining or may or may not be spreading is very valuable. And this is where dot maps can really help. They can really focus people uh, here on, on local areas almost through the season as well as year on year. And... Uh, Monitoring, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we need much better monitoring transects, time counts, monitoring single species transects, so we really know which are the conservation priorities, because at the end of the day, resources are limited and we need to focus on species that are doing badly or species that are doing badly that we can help. Some are doing badly and we might not be able to help them. As I mentioned earlier, more recording on the islands, please. Get involved locally. I think uh, this is really a key to it because then you draw in many more people, people who are not necessarily 
I supply obsessives, but they like to get out and meet other like-minded people. So the wonderful Bog Squad, um, Langlands Moss, local sites, say the Small Blue Campaign, Langus, fantastic. And they get such great coverage with the press and people love these sort of campaigns. And, and now, I don't know if I can mention it, but we've got Species on the Edge coming, uh, I guess, next year. And there'll be so many opportunities to get involved in local projects, uh, conservation, recording, um, educational work, training, all sorts of stuff going on. It'd be really, really an amazing uh, project. I'm very glad to see it get off the ground. And just do what you can to help others get involved in recording and monitoring. Uh, so this is the book, and I say the main aim is to try and get more people involved. So friends and family, please, buy them a copy of the book for Christmas. Why not? Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. That was, uh, that was a great summary and some really interesting themes arising. Uh, I think it's quite easy to feel envious of species further south, but really there's so much still to learn about Scottish butterflies. And I also think it's lovely that you included some snippets and, and poetry from volunteers as well. I'm sure it's going to be a very inspiring and useful resource. Thank you. So do we have any questions for Paul? Can't see any at the moment. Uh, people say in great talk and they, they're looking forward to getting their copy. No. So I, I expect you've been working on this for, for quite a long time, Paul, something, uh, something that you've always wanted to write. Uh, well, it has been going on for quite a number of years, but uh... As you know, only too well, obviously, it's uh, it's hard to sometimes focus enough time on, on getting these things produced. So I'm very lucky I've had the time to do that the last uh, couple of years and uh, uh, a lot of help from yourself and, and all the other contributors of the uh, anecdotes. I suppose just sort of listening to that talk, um, I don't want to downplay the information that's in it. So there's an awful lot of sort of up-to-date research uh, included in it and if people want to sort of study butterflies themselves which is very easy to do all you need is a bit of patience maybe a bit of luck but a bit of knowledge um, there's plenty of uh, opportunity to do research yourselves in Scotland on our butterflies and uh, the, the book has an extensive list of references if you want to sort of follow things up um, so I would really encourage anybody to, to start observing and recording uh, behaviour, life stages, food, different food plants, all sorts of things can be happening out there. And uh, it's easy to sort of assume that everything's well known. I mean, uh, Owen Figgis discovered orange tips breeding on uh, Smith's pepperworts at maybe Forest a couple of years back. And I don't think that was known before. So. That's one of the reasons that the brown argus has been able to spread much further north from southern England. It's started using different food plants. So maybe that sort of thing might be happening here under our noses. Absolutely. And if you, uh, this is probably a really difficult question, if you could pick one species uh, that you would encourage people to go out and find out more about, what, what would you choose? Oh, well, I, I mean, I... Uh, favourite species, I suppose, for, for a long time, and perhaps still is, was the Scotch Argus. And uh, I did a little bit of research on that, but uh, it was very sort of basic. But um, what, what I tried to spend some time doing when I was able to is try and uh, pin down its, its distribution, because its distribution almost certainly will be changing. But it's a, it's a butterfly which we don't get an awful lot of records for. I, I'm recorded for Dumfries and Galloway, and we get very few records even though Dumfries and Galloway is one of the hotspots of Scotch Argus. So uh, I know uh, that some people like Tam Stewart has been trying very hard to pin down its distribution in Lanarkshire. And it would be interesting to know if we can get uh, a little bit better information on its exact distribution. But I know there are so many things for everybody to do out there. 
Excellent. Well, hopefully somebody will, will feel inspired by that. Now, I do have one question from, from Jim. Um, he is saying, where you are now, Paul, are you seeing early evidence of similar problems there, even though you're a long way from Scotland? Oh, well, I think it's much too early for me to tell anything uh, about uh, the butterfly fauna here, where I am living now in uh, in the Canaries, um, the climate is changing now, like, like it's changing everywhere. And uh, uh, I think oh, certainly butterflies will respond to that. Um, but yes, yeah, so, but uh, I, we, are, we are doing some monitoring. There are some monitoring transects on La Palma and uh, we're starting to get to know what's going on. Great, and uh, your your chat about Scott Targus has inspired uh, a related question. So Jim's again saying there are a lot of upland areas with Scott Targus that are less accessible. Um, have we tried engaging with mountain walkers, for example, to try and get them to help us record species? Well, I'm not sure we've tried directly with uh, hill walkers at Scott Targus. We certainly tried for mountain ringlets a few years ago. We had a mountain ringlet postcard survey. We didn't get a huge response, but uh, we did get some useful records. So it's always worth a try, isn't it? Um, and, and maybe again, if, if people have access to a book or at least sort of information provided by the branches for targeted recording, say, you know, are you going up such and such a Monroe, please look out for Scott Chargas or mountain ringlet. Uh, if we know people who, who do that sort of thing, then, then we can be a bit more sort of proactive. Um, there are so many questions that need answering, really. Yeah, but uh, the more people we have doing it, the better. So, and I suppose the other thing to say is that obviously I, I labour climate change a bit in my talk, not quite so much in the book. But um, you know, everything that's going on in the world at the moment can be pretty, uh, pretty sort of uh, mind blowing. But as you all know, just getting out there in the sunshine watching recording butterflies is great for your not just for your physical health but mental health as well so i think it's something that we butterflies can offer in, in a huge 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 degree is is just encouraging people just to get out and enjoy the wildlife that's in their local area i suppose another thing which has just sort of cropped into my mind is that in the past we sort of tried to send out volunteers hundreds of miles to record butterflies and Perhaps in a, in a way that wasn't the right thing to do. It's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? We uh, drive hundreds of miles to measure the impact of climate change on butterflies. So I think the important thing is really, really get stuck into your local area and all sorts of things turn up. I mean, the checkered skipper on Mull, purple hair streak in Deeside, marsh artillery in Dumfries and Galloway, all new discoveries in the last couple of years. So there's an awful lot still to be discovered just you know, in, in your local area, I'm sure. Absolutely. I think we really saw that during lockdown as well, people really discovering their own back gardens, really. Um, so I've got a couple of questions in the chat box at the side. Can I just remind everybody to please put your questions in the Q&A box because they're easier to find. Now, I have a question from Miranda who wonders, could you just tell us a little bit more about ringlets spreading in Scotland? Well, again, I'm not sure I'm, I'm the right person to ask, but I think it's been seen right up, uh, right up the, the case nest by, by now. I think it's really a spread very fast, um, but mostly up the East Coast. Uh, it seems to be easier for butterflies spreading north to go up the East Coast. Um, but yes, I, I'm not sure. I mean, there are people in the audience who can say more about the precise distribution of the ringlet at the moment. Sure, if anybody wants to answer that question, feel free to write about it in the chat. Um, I know I've certainly been blown away by small skipper this year, just appearing everywhere across the borders on sites where I, I didn't see them before. Um, let's see if I can find another question. Um, is it important to engage forestry companies who manage landscape scale change, for example, on species like the Northern Brown Argus? Well, yes, of course, it's, it's important to, for, for butterfly conservation, 
to engage any uh, organization that has control over large amounts of land. Obviously, it's uh, that, that's the sort of scale at which we need to operate. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion in the last few years about the impact of forestry on Northern Brown Argus in particular and the borders. And we, I think we had this great project, which you mentioned earlier, that Barry was involved with and David Hill, to try and find out you know, where, where sites are at threat from afforestation, which is still a, a bit of a live topic, I'm sure. Um, yes, I, I think, if, you know, I guess that's more, perhaps usually more of a role for staff, but uh, if, if volunteers and members have the chance to, to chat to people who work in forestry companies, it's always worth it and buy them a copy of the book. Absolutely. Yeah, this is something that we do quite a lot in the borders and, and actually often relies on um, a volunteer noticing that a local site is going to be planted on and, and getting in touch with us so that we can help advise on butterfly friendly planting. So, yeah, volunteers are really important in that process, I think. Oops. Great. So I think. Uh, that's all the questions I can see at the moment. So we may come back to a few later, but thank you very much, Paul, for coming back and giving us a talk. I know there's been a lot of comments in the chat about people can't wait to receive their book or one person who got it yesterday, I think, and, and really, really loves it. So thank you very much and, and good luck. Wish you all the best of success with it. Thank you very much, Epiphany, and thank you all. Thank you all, really, for all your contributions and help over the years. Great. So next up, we are delving into my favorite theme. Uh, as you can see from my, my background, I love meadow creation. And Anthony is here to tell us all about it, followed by Lynn Bates from the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Over to you, Anthony. Brilliant. OK, well, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us today at Butterfly Conservation. Uh, I am currently the engagement officer at Butterfly Conservation, but for the previous three years, I've been the Helping Hands for Butterflies project officer, which has been a three year project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and by Nature Scott. Through part of the project, we've been creating um, urban meadows in nine parks across central Scotland in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Hamilton, Blantyre and Kirkintilloch. And through that, we've been involved with the local authorities in each of these areas. And for starters, though, most of the meadow areas were typical amenity grassland areas of parks with almost no biodiversity. You might see the odd fly uh, or uh, some different herbs among the grass, but really overall they were dominated by one or two species of grass. So there was a three year plan to increase the diversity of plants and insects at these sites. And the plan looked something like this, but if you remember back a few years ago, right in the middle of year one, um, that's when COVID uh, struck. So not everything went exactly to plan, but we did our best to stick to something like this, which involved cut and remove of the grass every year, as well as sowing yellow rattle and planting uh, wildflowers. So let's have a look at that. The important thing with meadow creation and management though, is to get the nutrient level down. So we cut and remove. This is because the tall grasses can suppress your lower growing wildflowers, but vigorous grass growth is promoted by high levels of nitrogen in the soil. So if grass is cut and then left to rot, it adds a lot of nitrogen back into the soil. So you're in this vicious cycle of more and more grass and fewer and fewer wildflowers. So cutting and lifting the grass over a period of a few years can break that cycle, reduce the nutrient level and make it better for wildflowers. In this project then, when the grass was cut, we disposed of it in green waste collection organized by the councils or under dense woodland nearby. So we weren't taking it off the site in most cases. We were finding small man-made woodlands. So effectively the carbon in that grass is going to grow trees instead of feeding more grass. And that's the way we looked at it. But we always checked to make sure there were no interesting wildflowers underneath the woodland before we disposed of it there. And this is roughly what it looked like. We had volunteers out in the autumn time with grass rakes, raking up the grass, putting it into these tonne bags and re removing it from the grassy area. So yellow rattle then, many of you will be familiar with it. It's often called the meadow maker. This uh, wildflower is a parasite of grass roots. It takes nutrients and water from the grass, so it weakens it um, and then allows other wildflowers to grow. The important thing is with, with yellow rattle is that it must be sown in autumn. If you're sowing it in spring, you can put it in the fridge for about two months to simulate the cold period that it needs in order to germinate. But it's a good time to be sowing it right now. It's quite simple to sow. And actually, this is Blantyre, uh, Stonefield Park in Blantyre. 
Here, this is what the site looked like before. We just had volunteers out with these really good metal rakes. We disturbed the soil, making lots of mud, then sewed the yellow rattle onto it and then trampled it in. And it took really well at the site. So you don't need to be turning over a site with uh, with large machinery. You can do this with just rakes and uh, and you know human human power. And this is the effect of it. So on the left hand side, you'll see where the yellow rattle was sown really densely. On the right hand side, you'll see it where the grass has been left unchecked. And there's quite a difference there in the vigour of that grass. So we were using the yellow rattle really to weaken the grass before we planted more wildflowers. So in year two and three, we used the wildflower plugs. These are useful for vegetated sites. So you can't really sow wildflowers uh, seeds onto grassy sites because they rarely take. Um, and it was difficult to add these sites to turn over the soil because there could be pipes or other, other things underneath. So we chose the wildflower plug method. And um, I'll show you now what we were intending to plant for butterflies. And it's important that we cater for their caterpillar food plants, because as we know, butterflies and moths have specific caterpillar plants uh, that, they're, that they need to breed upon. So it's important to remember then that uh, all the brown butterflies and several of our skippers just need grass to feed upon for their caterpillars. So some of the very common and vigorous grasses like Coxfoot, Yorkshire Fog, Common Couch and Bent grasses are all used by these common and widespread species of butterflies uh, like ringlets, meadow browns, skippers, etc. Um, so if you're dealing with an existing grassy area, there's probably no need to plant any of these because they're very widespread plants and nobody I know has ever sown Coxfoot in, or Yorkshire Fog into a meadow for butterflies. They just tend to be there, so don't worry about planting those. What you will want to include in your seed mix, though, are the finer leaves grasses like fescues and bent grasses. They can be used by caterpillars of species like the small heath. Um, so do include those in your mixes. Again, they also interact better with wildflowers. They don't become dense, they don't become tall, and therefore your wildflowers will get a better chance among those. Now onto the, some of the lysenids. Again, this is mostly for meadows, so I'm not talking about the hair streak butterflies, which mostly feed upon shrubs and trees. So if you're planting, say, to encourage small copper, you want to do it in a sunny area, such as a south-facing hillside, somewhere with really poor soil. But it's important that you include common sorrel in your seed mixes or sheep's sorrel. They're the two main caterpillar plants for the species. They're often not included in seed mixes, even those promoted for butterflies and bees. So do buy some common sorrel if you want to help the small copper. And then for common blue, you really want to uh, plant common bird's foot trefoil, uh, Lotus corniculatus. Um, that's the main caterpillar food plant of that species. Again, unfortunately, a lot of seed mixes don't include bird's foot trefoil, so check your seed mix, and if it's not there, buy some and add it to it. But then for the white butterflies in meadows, um, probably the best plant, especially for damp meadows, is called cuckoo flower, also known as lady smock. So as many of you be, will be familiar with, you can find the eggs of butterflies feeding upon these. Orange tips will feed upon the seed pod, and the small white and green veined white will feed upon the leaves. Um, but for these butterflies, you'll often find that because they have a second brood in late summer, you also require other habitats nearby. So if you have a woodland nearby, you might get garlic mustard or charlock or certain plants which are more associated with woodlands and disturbed places than meadows. But if you only have a meadow to deal with, plant cuckoo flower. And of course, we want to plant nectar plants for the adults. So taller plants like the uh, knapweed, which you can see in the photo, provide a lot of nectar, but also go for tall plants like field scabious, red campion, oxide daisy and meadow cranes bull. They'll get their heads above the grasses and they'll do better than the, the smaller plants. Then other plants with tendrils that can climb over the grasses like bush vetch, common vetch, tufted vetch and meadow vetchling. Again, they can use their tendrils to get over the grass so they're not stuck at the base of the ground. And then tough plants, some plants are just survivors and things like yarrow do well everywhere and red clover seems to be able to hold its own as well against the, the grasses. So of course we couldn't talk about meadows today without mentioning moths. Um, with moths there's a bewildering array of caterpillar plants and lifestyles. So two and a half thousand species in the UK, your urban meadows are actually much more likely to have more moth species than butterfly species. And many of them feed upon long grass. So at several of my sites, I was finding a uh, large yellow underwings there. I was also getting anther moth, um, but we also know dark arches and those grass moths.
feed generally upon long grass. So again, another reminder that your meadows can't just be completely wildflower. You need to have the grasses there. And of course, uh, the burnet moths, some beautiful moths to see, the red six spot, narrow border five spot, caterpillars feed upon bird's foot trefoil or red clover. And then some bed straws for things like the common carpet. But really, I could go on all day talking about the caterpillar plants for moths that can be found in meadows, but these are just a, a few for starters. So how did it go? So through the project, we found breeding butterflies at all but one of the new meadows. And the one where we didn't get any but breeding butterflies, we did get nectaring butterflies there. But we reckon that it was just, it's a very urban site with few opportunities for butterflies to colonize from nearby. So they might have just struggled to get there. But overall, three acres, over three acres of new habitat for butterflies, moths, and other insects is now created across the sites. The number of species is increasing every year. And for me, it was such a delight. After two years into the project, I was getting meadow brown butterflies at Stolefield Park in Blantar. Now, for most of us, our urban parks, you don't see brown butterflies in the mid. Uh, flying around in them. So the fact that just providing some long grass and some wildflowers allowed these meadow browns to come in and start breeding was for me a real moment of realization that we need to be doing more of this and putting our parks to better use. But then the silver noise site is at the other end of the scale. We had 12 species of butterfly breeding there, by far the best site. So it includes all these brown butterflies and the small skipper because there's lots of long grass. Then there's some woodland near the site. So we were also getting these white butterflies. Then there's some huge patches of nettles. So again, I didn't plant the nettles, they were just there. So I can't take credit for them, but just seeing that the nettles are there um, and that the butterflies which result from those nettles um, are able to, to nectar at the site was good. And for me, a wee bonus was the small copper. So it was the only site where I'm getting small copper. So it's one of my favorites uh, to see there. So a range of uh, usability by different butterflies, but just to say that anything you do to improve those amenity grass areas is going to increase the biodiversity automatically because it's at such a low bar that you're starting from. And I just got a couple of photos of some of the sites that we created through the project. some inspiration to you uh, and to maybe work on some meadow sites yourself you could do it in your garden or local green space or create a new wild space there i just want to say thank you to everybody who's been involved uh, in the project to create these meadows and to the funders who funded that work and i also want to say thanks to those local authorities listed here so i just want to say thanks very much for listening um, i'm going to hand over now to lynn um, and we're happy to take questions on meadows at the end of both of our talks okay thanks for that Anthony and um, yeah so it's great to actually go after Anthony because he's actually said most of the things that I don't need to say so I'm just going to focus on a on a on some of the bigger meadows we've been making um, down in Ayrshire but before we start just a couple of things about the Nectar Network um, it's a Scottish Wildlife Trust led project um, and the aim really uh, it's up there on the screen is to connect nectar and pollen rich sites along the Ayrshire coast so existing sites as well as creating more and um, we want to do this by creating a network of sites, but also people and partners. So it's very much about signing up partners and um, obviously to enable all pollinating insects um, to grow, spread and thrive. So um, couldn't really say anything uh, before um, I kick off with, without acknowledging our funders. We've just found out yesterday that we've had more funding uh, come through from the Fairways Foundation. So that's fantastic. And we've been funded for the last few years uh, by Nature Scott. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So those of you who aren't aware of, um, so much aware of the Ayrshire Coast, this is a quick, a quick map to show you uh, where from, we were based in Irvine, um, Scottish Wildlife Trust Southwest Reserves um, uh, office, but uh, our whole area for the, um, is Irvine to Girvin. So from North Ayrshire, where there's uh, small dots are there all the way down into South Asia, down into Girvan. So it's a huge area. It's about 80 kilometers um, along the coast and inland by about five kilometers. So that's that's the area that um, I'm working with. But I wanted to spend today, um, next sort of five, 10 minutes, just talking about a couple of the big sites that we've um, created in the last three years. Um, we started in 
um, 2019, November 2019, um, got, getting ready to look at um, making some larger meadows and then obviously um, went into lockdown. So this is a site that we had our eye on. Um, it's, it's a local beach park, urban beach park. And as you can see, it's, it's predominantly, it's, it's all amenity grassland. It's cut within an inch of its life. Um, we managed to convince the uh, North Asia Council to partner with us to look at how we could create some larger areas. So this was a couple of half a hectare, so 5,000 square meters, two sites, very prominent. Um, and the council were very keen to, um, for us to have a go and experiment and see <clears throat> what's gonna work the best um, for, for obviously for it to look nice and flowery, uh, to reduce their, their cutting so they would only need to cut once a year at the back end of the year and obviously help our pollinators. So, so basically that was September 2020 and this is what it looks like now. So two years later, that was this summer, lots of, um, it, it's been a, a fantastic couple of summers. Um, of flowers, lots of increase in, in abundance and uh, diversity of, of plant species. Um, we, we, I just really want to show you how we actually got to here because um, it, it took us a, a bit of trialing, a bit of experimenting. So just to go back from, from that, uh, that September um, 2020 when we identified a couple of sites, this was October, the following month, we, we trialed a couple of different ways to prepare the ground. So um, we, we scarified hard, we brought in, in contractors. Uh, we ploughed one site, um, which may be a bit controversial. I know um, we were just not getting through the ground. This is very species poor. It's, it's basically a man-made uh, beach park with very poor soil, nothing really uh, other than grass there. So we experimented with a couple of ways um, to prepare the ground. We sowed exactly the same seed. Uh, we're using local native uh, wildflower seed from Scotia, but it's all flowers. Uh, we're not we're in this site. We're not um, sowing grass at all. Our theory is that the grass will come. So we did that the first, um, the October 2020, and this was our first um, summer. And uh, I'm hoping to play a wee video here, which may and I've been told it's not great, but I'd like to show it um, just to give you a flavor of sitting in the middle of the meadow. Butterflies, bees, hoverflies. This was August. So it already, a lot of the annuals in the first year had gone over, but it was still just spectacular. It was just um, flowering and it went on flowering right up until mid, mid September. So we were really pleased with this site. Um, so we'd managed to get the council on board. They, managed, they, were, they were happy, we'd, we'd sold it to them. That was the whole point because they were not keen to, to, um, to do it unless we could have a high impact, which we did. So then we moved on and, and we were allowed to extend the meadow. So we extended it by another half a hectare and we decided to do um, a green hay experiment. So we, we went in, we prepared, another half a hectare and we sowed one site, one half of the site with uh, seed, again, uh, our Nectar Network seed mix and green hay. We cut the existing meadow, brought it over, put it in the back of a muck spreader and spread it out um, over the other site. And um, this is just some of the results from, uh, this is this year um, from that um, experiment. So the picture on the left is, um, is the original donor meadow. This is its second year. It's it's increase, increasing in abundance and the species richness is just is just increasing. Um, the botanical species richness is increasing and, and we are finding that people are just stopping and taking photos and, and posting pictures on, on social media. It's been fantastic. The picture on the top right there, you'll see, you probably recognize Anthony, that's um, during the meadow making workshop in the first of September. So that's the green hay experiment. Um, we, um, we wandered around the meadows um, during the workshop and, um, and it was great. We were so pleased with the, the green hay experiment. Um, so we just literally used the seed from the donor meadow and, uh, and spread it out. And the, the picture at the bottom is the original 
uh, one of the original Meadows as well. That's its second year. So we were we were really pleased. The council were pleased. The public were were pleased. So we we were encouraged to to continue and um, and this two weeks after this meadow making workshop we held um, here in Irvine, we went in and cut um, all of the original meadows. So it's about one and a half hectares. Um, cut them, um, did a hay rake, collected them all up, and then did two journeys with the with the um, um, muck spreader. We'd already prepared four new sites, so we've increased the area by another two hectares. So we got four new sites already and then um, went over and spread the, the green hay. What we're doing now with this is we're spreading it and then running it over with a big roller just to just to get more, to be really sure we're getting that um, seed soil contact. Um, so that was just, that just happened um, a few weeks ago. So yeah, we're hoping that uh, for next, next spring, next summer we'll get a good show. So, what this is doing is saving us thousands of pounds. Um, if I was to make two hectares, it would cost me just in seed alone over 15,000 pounds, but to prepare it using the green hay, um, it's less than 3,000. So it's saving money and it's enabling us to make bigger, more meadows. And it's not just um, wildflowers that are we have, last year we sowed, we're aware that obviously grass is important, as Anton was just saying. Um, we, we didn't add the grass in the first original meadows because we wanted them to be uh, um, just, just pure flowers. Um, but these meadows we made last year, two half hectares, and then next to um, a couple of our reserves in Irvine. So it's still amenity grassland, but it's slightly more remote. It's not as prominent. So we uh, we used um, a more traditional wildfire meadow uh, mix, um, so it's 80% grass, 20% flowers. And this was the this summer, so we were really pleased with this. We've we're going to give it another year to develop next year, and then we'll start using that um, as green hay. So, so we are you know aware that we do grass is important, um, and and we're aware that the grass will come in our other meadows as well. And just to finish off. Um, we have been doing surveys, pollinator monitoring surveys um, with some of our volunteers and we've had um, both Anthony and um, Tom down um, to do some various workshops and training and surveying. And we're really grateful for all the, the partnership working we've been doing because it's been fantastic. Um, and just to call out if there's anyone out there who's um, close enough to the Asher Coast, who's keen to come down and help us uh, start to, to do more monitoring. We'd be more than happy to have you and we will be doing some more training next year uh, because that's our next, as part of our next funding is to really try and get a landscape scale uh, monitoring system set up. Um, so, so yeah, um, I think that's me, Anthony. Brilliant. Thanks, Lynn. I was so inspired when I visited those meadows. Uh, um, I've been torturing you ever since to come and speak at our events and to get involved in things. So thank you for that. And Epiphany will have questions for, for me and you now, I guess. Yeah, thank you to both of you. What an amazing result. Some of those photos were just fabulous. Um, I'm sure most of us will have heard that really alarming statistic that we've lost over 97% of our wildflower meadows. So this is really an important topic which just often doesn't get the attention that it deserves and it's nice to see some different techniques for meadow creation as well. I know quite often I advise people just to let their grass grow for a year and see what's already in the seed bank because sometimes you can be really surprised. Um, so I've got a few questions and lots of people just agreeing with me that they thought the pictures and the project were amazing. So first question for Lynn, um, it sounds like the council were quite quite on board and willing to let you experiment a little bit. So I just wondered if you had any advice for people if they're thinking about approaching their local council. Yeah, definitely. They, they were sort of on board. They were they were they took a bit of persuading, um, but they they were keen to to uh, to do something, but they just don't know how to. And that's what I've realised uh, in the last three years is that there's people within the council who are keen to do um, more for biodiversity generally, but it, it's it's showing them. So uh, if it, that was my, I suppose what they what 
it bought you know what what the reason they bought into it it was because i they were happy for me to um and they come i convinced them that it would look spectacular now i didn't know whether it would because you never know when you make these meadows but you hope so um so yeah i i would say um is to try and show other projects like ours and other projects that have worked and show them and that's what i was doing with the council and i was bringing in examples of other projects other ways that had worked and how they could save money and that yeah. that i think um sold it to them because now they've got meadows they don't need, need me they know what they're doing i can step away and they can keep making more meadows because they've got the donor site so i think the money side does does sell it to them Absolutely. And I suppose another reason for putting all those kind of colourful uh, cornfield annuals in in the first year was to get that really spectacular, this is going to look amazing, people are going to love it sort of impression. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, we had four annuals in and now they've obviously, you know, they're really not needed now because the perennials start flowering so much earlier. Um, yeah, they're established. Excellent. Uh, so a question for you, Anthony. Um, we're talking about meadows here and we've seen photos of quite large areas. It kind of gives the impression that you need a you need a whole football pitch worth of space to turn into a meadow. But I think we know that that isn't quite true. You can actually uh, do some great things with small spaces. Do you just want to give a, a little bit of information on that? Yes. Um... Well, actually, a lot of the sites that we asked the councils for, we asked for a smaller site because we didn't have enough money to work on bigger sites. And I didn't want to break the volunteers by saying you have to do a huge, massive site to work on. So occasionally they just gave us a whole corner because it was easier to explain that to their grounds team. So even in those extra corners where just grass grew, you were getting breeding uh, brown butterflies turning up in those so it was a reminder to me to take any amount of land you can because a lot of it is at such a low level already that you know anything we can do to to try to bring it to um to a better standard is is good um and it there's various amounts of research on the on the size of plot you need to encourage butterflies to stay and breed there obviously the bigger the better but i've had volunteers who are just growing long grass in their gardens in edinburgh and they're getting speckled wood breeding there so that's you know typical garden size you know a backyard and yet speckled wood are there um probably the same for holly blue won't need a large area either so i would say the more you can do the better and obviously even though butterflies don't turn up everywhere but moths are if moths really are everywhere there's so many different species they're in our urban sites so you know tiny patches can make a big difference even for the stage where they pupate you know where they need to go into the ground and they need some leaf litter just that lack of disturbance is going to allow more species to complete their life cycles Great, so every little helps. And even if you just got a garden, there's always something that you can do. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question from Rosemary asking, if you cut and remove grass in the autumn, does that affect the butterflies that are breeding there? Yes, that was a good question. That's one that caught my eye. But for most of our breeding butterflies in Scotland, they spend the winter as caterpillars. The One of the exceptions, though, is are the small skippers. So, and I know Rosemary's in the Highlands where they don't, the Highlands where they don't get small skippers yet but small skippers remain in the stems of tall grasses through the winter, whereas almost all the other brown butterflies and the small copper and small uh, common blue go to the base of the plant in the winter time. Um, and from the autumn onwards, they stop feeding and just put themselves in the base of the plant. So by cutting the grass, you're not going to disturb them too much. But I always recommend that when a site is established and you're getting your wildflowers there, try to leave a third of the site every year that, and you rotate that every three years so that you don't cut everything back. Um, so hopefully that allows more species to survive. And if you're concerned, if you know that there are brown butterflies there, for example, I would leave, I would raise the, um, the, the cutters, the, the blades, so that there's more species which are at the base of the plant uh, can survive. Perfect, thank you. Uh, we've got a lot of questions, but not much time, so I'm just going to pick one and we can maybe come back to some of them later. Um, let's go for Emma's question. She would like to know a little bit more about the recording that happened at the site. So how did you confirm that butterflies were breeding there? In most cases, it had to be me uh, who went um, because of COVID as well. So originally, um, we were planning to have people go out in all of the years and get people in the first year as set up as recorders who would go again and again. But obviously, COVID meant we couldn't meet in person, really, for most of the project, um, you know, to do that training. 
most of it had to be me visiting the sites at least three times a year. So I visit in spring to look for the white butterflies, then in midsummer and then late summer. And if you've got a brown butterfly around uh, in long grass, you can usually assume that it's breeding because they don't really fly around the countryside. Um, they, they don't really do that. Um, whereas our you know uh, peacocks and small tortoise shells will, but the brown butterflies tend to only be somewhere if they're breeding. So that was usually assumed that they're breeding at a site, or we can look for eggs. With the white butterflies, it's fairly easy to, to find their eggs. Perfect. Well, thank you again to both of you. Excellent talks, excellent photographs. And yeah, uh, in the break, if we've got some time, we'll, we'll ask some more questions. Thanks. Great. So to finish our first session of talks, we're going to hear about an excellent piece of work from two of my favorite moth trappers down here, Ruben Singleton and John Williams. Now, I think I'm right in saying that you're doing the presenting today. Is that right, Ruben? Yeah, that's correct, Epiphany. So yes, um, I've given myself a bit of a challenge here. Um, first of all, following such illustrious speakers, and then making the foolish decision to do a talk on a micro moth for 20 minutes. But um, hopefully I'll be able to convince you that this is anything but boring. And the only thing boring about this moth is its name. As Epiphany alluded to, um, this really is a double act. And even though John Williams isn't presenting, he prepared the talk. And he's also been involved as my right hand man in this project right from the beginning. And so there it is, that is Lampronia capitella, also known as the current shoot borer. The Latin name is quite interesting. Uh, Lampronia is Greek for brilliant or bright. Um, now you can see it's quite an attractive moth. I think it's brilliant anyway. And people love to come up with alternative names for things. And this particular moth has been variously called the chalk ice moth. You can see the dark chocolate and vanilla colouring of this moth. Perhaps the younger members of the audience would call it a magnum moth. And my so-called friends, of course, um, call it the boring moth. But um, as we shall see, it is anything but that. So what is it? It's from a family of shoot boring moths. There's about half a dozen species um, found in Scotland. It's very small. It's only the adult um, has a wingspan, um, wing length of only seven or eight millimetres, which is probably about the width of your little fingernail. So that gives you an idea of how big it is. And it gets its common name because it bores into current buds on mature stems in spring. It goes on black and red currants. It also goes on gooseberries, but funnily enough, not flowering common um, currants. And it's on the wing in May and June. So this is what happens to a current stem when it gets eaten by a current shoot borer. The whole thing becomes very wilted very rapidly. And this is why um, this moth was seen as a bit of a pariah, particularly amongst the fruit growing industry um, a couple of generations ago. What we can see here on the right hand side is a zoomed in image of um, a larvae peering out of a shoot. And this is the result at the end of summer. Um, if you have an infestation of current shoot borers in your currants, you end up with a completely denuded stem with no leaves and perhaps more importantly, no currants. And it was viewed as quite an agricultural pest back in the day. There are a number of other similarly re related species. So it's only one pariah in a family of pariahs. And what we see here is the raspberry moth, and it's very much a similar idea. The um, caterpillar burrows into the raspberry cane and ends up living on the highly nutritious new shoots and wilting them. This photograph was taken by Ruth Robertson, who was an excellent lepidopterist, lived locally in Peeblesher, but is sadly no longer with us. So back to Capitella then. Um, thanks to Patrick Cook for producing this map. Um, it's a it's quite a rare moth. Um, it's described as um, nationally scarce A, which means that it's only found in between 16 and 30 10 kilometer squares or hectares across the UK. And you can see from the map there, it's very much concentrated in the south of England, particularly in East Anglia. You can also see there are no records for Ireland. And there's one record for Wales down here. And until 2017, 
and there was only one record from from Scotland. And this is a very interesting record as well. It was found by Mark Young, who many of us um, will know, many of you will know, and he found it in what he described as a very old and chaotic patch of gooseberry bushes in a garden next to the River Dee in Ballater in 1985. Now, I just wish I had that turn and phrase. I, I absolutely love it. I'm going to say it again. A very old and chaotic gooseberry bushes. It's tremendous. Unfortunately, though, they didn't stay very old and chaotic for long because they were dug up in 1989 and the gooseberry patch disappeared along with the moths. And despite Mark looking... Um, in similar sites nearby for many, many years, he has been unsuccessful in refinding it. So 1989, the moth became extinct in Scotland. So how was it refound in 2017? Well, there's a story to this, and it's mainly due to the um, sister species, the raspberry moth, which I showed you a photograph of earlier. Um, John Williams and I received a copy of Keith Bland's Micro Lepidoptera records for Peeblesher. Hundreds and hundreds of micro moth records. And one thing which jumped out at us was um, how many raspberry moths he'd recorded across the county. Indeed, he managed to um, record five separate sites in one day in April 1990. So John and I thought, oh, this is great. We'll go out looking at raspberry canes and we'll find hundreds of these raspberry moths, no problem at all. And so we started in spring 2016. And we looked and we looked and we looked, but we had no success. Ruth Robertson did a bit better. She found a um, feeding sign and a raspberry cane in um, early 2016, but I didn't succeed until 3rd of April 2017. And I was delighted to find a raspberry moth after all this effort. And I was still in the zone. And a couple of weeks later, after that discovery, I was walking along the, the old railway line between Gallus Hills and Peebles, which is now, um, it's been disused since the 1960s, and it's now a pedestrian path. In the top right-hand corner of this photo, you can see Peebles in the distance, which is about three kilometres away. And then down the middle of the photo, you can see the River Tweed and the railway path if you can see my cursor is going up here and sandwiched between the river tweed and the railway path there is a patch of woodland more of which in a minute anyway to cut a long story short i saw a wilted current shoot on a current bush next to the path and i thought to myself mm, that's a bit odd it looks rather like a raspberry moth but it's in a current bush rather than a raspberry cane so i snipped it off and took it home and then I entered into some correspondence with Mark Young and he suggested that I try and rear it. And that's what I did. And three weeks later, out popped a current shoot borer. And the West, they say, is history. A little bit more about the site. Again, you can see the River Tweed running through the middle of the photograph here. And the woodland where it's found is on the um, left hand side of the river. And you can see there's some quite wide um grassy areas next to river and within these grow current bushes and the currents are found all along the river as well now you can see on this map um the distribution of the moth as we know it today all these dots um you can see along the northern edge of the river tweed correspond to current bushes which we have found evidence of um current shoot borer moth larvae in and this brings me to the next part of the talk, which is why, in my opinion, the moth has switched from being a pariah to a paragon. Now, there's been a bit of discussion about what paragon actually means between myself and John. Um, but I like the Cambridge Dictionary definition, and I'll read it out to you, which is a person or a thing that is perfect or has an extremely large amount of a particularly good char characteristic. And in my view, Lampronia capitella is a paragon of um, Lepidoptera conservation in Scotland. I'm going to spend the second half of the talk telling you why. So if we go back to the previous slide, we can see in the red line boundary here, um, PCT Eschiel's Community Wood, which is what it is now. But in 2018, it belonged to the Forestry Commission. And at that time, they were disposing of various bits of pieces of woodland across Scotland, which no longer made any economic sense to them. 
and myself john and a few others decided that we would try and buy the woodland from the forest commission through the then um, very new community asset transfer scheme with conserving the, um, the micro moth as a major objective and justification of this community buyout um, and to cut a long story short we bought the wood in 2018 for 36,000 pounds and we even got a discount of 4,000 pounds from the valuation of 40,000 because of the works we were going to do to protect a UK biodiversity action plan and Scottish biodiversity list species, thereby delivering the Scottish government's um, objectives for biodiversity. So now that land um, we see here um, in the red line boundary is now owned by People's Community Trust. It's in community ownership and it has a management plan. You can see, though, from this map that um, the moth um, isn't just found within the community woodland. It's also found in tip wood upstream to the left. And further left still, it is found in the riparian strip at Peebles Sewage Farm. Now, this gives both challenges of and opportunities. Tip wood is um, the imaginatively named wood, which has developed on the former Peebles rubbish tip, which was used um, as a landfill site right up until the early 1990s. It was capped around 2000 with topsoil and then planted with broadleaf woodland. And it's quite a pleasant site today. And we've had lots of discussions with the council and they are quite happy to um, manage the woodlands and riparian strip for the moth and they're aware that it is there. The Peeble Sewage Farm, if you remember, is further upstream again. Um, this one's a bit more problematical. Peebles, like so many small towns in Scotland, is expanding at one heck of a rate. And as well as expanding the population, it's expanding the amount of sewage which it produces. So there's real pressure on the existing infrastructure and there are concerns that there will be plans to expand or modernise the sewage farm in the coming years, which could lead to inadvertent losses of current bushes and the moth along the river. So we've tried to speak to them. We've even enlisted the great Tom Prescott at um, Butterfly Conservation to speak to them. And so far, um, I think it's fair to say that we're being ignored, um, but we will keep trying. So you can see there, um, we've secured the site as best we can. The next step in conservation is actually understanding the moth's life cycle. And we've got um, a Bible, which we, um, which we use for this, published in 1892. It's called The Life History of Lampronia Capitella. And basically, Mr. Chapman of Furbank, Hereford, was given... Um, a load of mature larvae by one of his mates and then sleeve them on red current and recorded the whole life cycle. So we are actually very lucky in terms of knowing what the life cycle is like. This board you can see here, or this slide, is actually from an orientation board which you have posted um, in the community woodland. And I think it um, summarises the life cycle quite nicely. So you've got the moth here in the middle and it emerges in May flies um, to its current patch where it finds a black currant or red currant fruitlet and it injects its eggs into the um, fledgling currant using its ovipositor and it's one or two eggs it injects and then these caterpillars feed on the actual seeds rather than the juicy currant um, itself and it does that for a couple of months and then you can see it here it emerges in August and then it spends the winter in a spinning actually on the stem of the current, either behind a um, leaf bud or down um, on the trunk of the current bush. And it stays there over winter. And then in the spring, when it warms up a bit and the currents start to shoot, out it comes from its winter accommodation and bores into the new, highly nutritious current shoots. Stays there for two or three weeks eating and before actually pupating inside the shoot where it stays another two or three weeks before emerging. So that's the life cycle. And what we've also learned is that this moth is bloody good at holding its breath. Um, this is what John and I call um, current shoot borer bore central. 
Um, this is a huge stand of red currant bushes sitting on the riverbank, and every year it gets flooded by the River Tweed. And you can see see here all the flotsam and jetsam. The river's been another two or three feet higher than that, so the the um, caterpillars can be completely submerged, but it doesn't seem to do them too much harm. So that's its life cycle. The other thing we need to know is how many we're dealing with. And so that's where monitoring comes in. Um, we've decided um, that the best way of doing this is just by counting the wilted shoots. And here he is, there's the maestro himself, Professor Williams, looking for shoot borers. Um, we do this in about the second or third week of April, depending on the season. Obviously, if it's a cold spring, the, the um, current shoot a lot later than they do in an early spring. And you always have to be careful about frost, which um, can result in shoots looking wilted, high winds, which snap off shoots, resulting in shoots looking wilted. And if you leave it too late, um, the shoots have been bored by the larvae and they've fallen off. So there's going to be nothing left there to count. So there is a very small window when you can actually do the um, survey. And it does help if you live right next to the site like we do. And so there's the results from the last four, um, three or four years. You can see that to begin with in 2018, we just counted the bushes with feeding signs. And then we refined that technique again um, in 2020 when we started actually counting the number of shoots on the bushes with feeding signs. And you can see last year um, we counted 398 shoots um, with feeding signs. And that was across 31 bushes along the river. Um, proportions, black currants to red currants, there's probably two red currants for every black currant. And we've also think we've recorded um, feeding signs in gooseberry, but we're unable to actually confirm that with frass. They don't seem to prefer red currants over black currants. It's just whatever bush is available. So that's how we go about monitoring them. There, there is the question, of course, um, which is fairly fundamental in terms of conservation. We don't know the answer to this. You might have one caterpillar feeding on multiple shoots and wilting multiple shoots. And we don't know whether one female just lays her couple of hundred eggs or one bush or whether she goes up and down the river dropping um, eggs where, or injecting eggs into currents wherever she finds them. And this is fairly fundamental. You might have 308, 398 um, larvae um, and 31 females on individual bushes, or you might have females going from bush to bush and larvae feeding on multiple plants. And the total population may be much, much less than that and very small indeed. We did think a couple of years ago that there was going to be a silver bullet um, um, for monitoring adults because we didn't have much success in doing what it says in the books, which say the adult flies around the food plants in May and June on warm, sunny afternoons, and it's also attracted to light. Well, we've had moth traps in the middle of these stands of um, currants, and we've caught precisely zip. And despite John and I walking up and down the river on many warm, sunny days in May and June, we have counted zip. Um, so the silver bullet came about with John Clifton at Anglian Leps um, developing a pheromone lure for use on Lampronia capitella. Um, so we got a lure and we trotted down there with a spring in our step, hoping to attract clouds and clouds of Lampronia capitella. And we attracted one, which you can see in the bottom right of the screen here. And there it is. One moth couldn't even be bothered to get to the pheromone lure, um, sat down on a leaf about 50 centimetres away. And this wasn't a one off. John repeated this exercise a couple of days later and had exactly the same result. So pheromone lures don't seem to work particularly well. So we're stuck with counting shoots. Um, in terms of enriching the habitat, obviously the simplest thing to do is plant more currants. Now, we gave this some thought, and it would have been very easy just to nip off to the nearest garden centre and buy some um, bushes commercially, or take up the offers of many of the local gardeners who said, oh, you can have current cuttings um, off our currants in the garden. However, we were reluctant to do this. 
Um, the other current feeders we know in Scotland, moth-wise, current clearing, phoenix, spinach, v-moth, they've all declined as well. So is there an issue with modern current bushes not having any nutritional value? Anyway, to cut a long story short, we decided to take cuttings from the site. And initially we took half a dozen cuttings as a pilot, which John grew on in his garden. And you can see here planting out next to the river, which seems to have been fairly successful in becoming established. Once we knew they were easy to grow, um, we were lucky enough to get a grant from East Scotland branch of butterfly conservation to actually take 120 cuttings and then getting these grown on by a local plant nursery. So the ones you see here, they, they were cuttings collected in December, which were grown on for two summers and then planted out in October of last year. And we were lucky enough to get the scouts to help us with this, which is great and it brings us on to the last strand of conservation which of course is community engagement and raising the profile of the moth um i'm gonna have to apologize for the hyperbole here home of scotland's rarest moth well is it but um we live in a post-truth age anyway so who cares it's a good line scottish ra scotland's rarest moth and even better we have the caped crusader himself um, who actually dressed up as the moth and entered the fancy dress parade of the annual Beltane Festival. And he was also responsible for coming up with the worst pun in history, far worse than anything you'd even hear from the lips of Tom Prescott. So lots of um, raising the profile going on. Um, we have regular newsletters which about the woodland, but which also include the um, trials and tribulations of the moth. And we've had various open days. So where does this leave us? We've looked elsewhere all along the tweeds. There are plenty of current bushes, both upstream and downstream, but we've never found the moth outside this site, which suggests we've got a bit of an island population. Um, and island populations are quite fragile and open to extreme events. Um, small breeding populations mean there's probably a genetic bottleneck and the um, population isn't particularly fit. It's going to be inbred. There's the real risks of um, inadvertent um, damage from bulldozers if the Scottish water sewage works expand, for instance. And then there's the whole range of climate change related risks, flood, fire and disease, both of the moth itself or its food plants. Any one of these things could wipe out such a fragile population. So I think looking forward, we're starting to consider translocation to other sites, but we can't do that until we know how many we've got at Eshiels itself. So that's the end of my talk. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you find the moth as exciting as we do and not boring in the slightest. Thank you, Ruben and John. What a fantastic bit of detective work, I think, on a moth that is far from boring. Um, I really love its ice cream themed nicknames as well. Fantastic. Um, and it kind of links back to what Paul was saying earlier about there just being so much to discover about Scottish butterflies and moths. So it's an uh, inspiration to just uh, pick a species and get investigating. Um, so let's see if we've got any questions for you. So Hugh would like to know, do the current bushes survive the boring moth feeding on them? So is it just the shoots that, that die? Is the bush OK? Yeah, the bush seems to be OK, Hugh. Um, we don't have any evidence of um, dead bushes along the river. I think it's probably similar to us getting a bad cold. Um, it's probably quite unpleasant for them, but it doesn't kill them and they survive. And it's the usual thing. You'd have to be a very inefficient, stupid parasite to kill your host. And Zoe says, um, did you say that the old and chaotic bushes found by Mark were also by a river? So the river must be quite important to the species somehow. Yeah, you might think that. Um, I think there is something in that. I mean, certainly a lot of the sites down south are associated with riverine woodland as well. 
Um, there is something I didn't put into the talk, which I um, I can talk about now, is that um, I have it on good authority from the locals that there used to be a fruit farm in the fields north of the railway um, up until the beginning of the Second World War. So maybe our moth has um, jumped out of its um, fruit farm into the um currents along the river i should also say that red currant is a native species in in scottish woodlands and particularly those in in riparian areas so yeah zoe's question is there a link to rivers and i think there is but um there's also a whole lot of stuff um going on in the background as well which we simply don't know about Great. Well, thank you for everybody's great questions. We're running a little bit behind, so I'll just ask one more thing, Ruben. Um, it sounds like you've still got quite a lot of work to do. So would you be keen to have people help you survey next year? Is that something they can get in touch with you about? Yeah, um, I don't know quite the best way of getting the word out, but um, the more, more the merrier when it comes to um, monitoring the moth, because I'm absolutely convinced it must be elsewhere in Scotland. And the more people, it's like all these things. Once you've actually seen the seen the moth or its feeding signs for yourself, it suddenly becomes much easier to find it. And I am confident that it will be found um, elsewhere in Scotland before too long. Excellent. Well, lots of people saying they really enjoyed your talk, Ruben. So thank you very much for telling us all about it. So are you ready to go with your moths, Tom? Yes, I, I think so. Well, yeah, good Good morning, everybody. You join me today in a very lovely, uh, sunny King Usi. Um, now, uh, normally this is a double act. Uh, it's normally myself and Nigel, you know, we're the Chuckle Brothers. Um, but uh, unfortunately today, uh, Nigel is on holiday. Um, so you're just reliant on what moths I've caught. Now, to, to catch lots of moths, uh, you need the weather to be um, mild, uh, not windy, and ideally dry. And of course, the, uh, the last week, really, uh, every time I've run my trap, uh, the weather has been very cold, very windy, and very wet. So unfortunately, I haven't got very many moths to show you. Um, the great thing with having Nigel here is Nigel is normally a real moth magnet. He's got the ability to catch phenomenal numbers of, of moths. Um, so, so far this year at his house, he has caught an amazing 35,838 different oh, moths. Um, his previous annual best was just over 18,000. And that's 474 species that he's caught. So he really, really is a moth magnet. So unfortunately, um, you're, you're dealing with me, uh, less of a moth magnet, but I have got a, a, a few moths to show you. So if you just bear with me, I will try and flip my camera around. Hopefully this is working. Ah, right, here we go. So I've, as I say, I've been running my trap uh, the last few nights and I've got uh, three or four species to show you. And now, uh, because the weather wasn't that great, um, I was also sugaring. And I find at this time of year, even on really poor nights, it's possible to find moths by sugar or by wine ropes. And most of the moths that I'm showing you now, I've caught in that way. So this is a red sword grass. Um, it's the commoner of the two sword grasses. There's also the sword grass. Um, it's very, very much uh, trying to imitate a stick, as you can see. They also sort of play dead normally, but you can see there that it's got a very, uh, quite a lot of contrast on its upper wing between its body and the paler edges. Also, it, uh, so that's one thing that makes it a red sword grass. The other thing is its dark legs. You see, it's got very dark brown legs. If this was a sword grass, those legs would be would be pale. So that came to sugar. I had about half a dozen of those um, over the uh, uh, over the last two or three nights. As I say, all at sugar, not a single one uh, in the moth trap. So that's red sword grass. Here's my second species. 
This is green brindled crescent. I'm trying to zoom in on my camera, but it's not working. So hopefully that will suffice. Hopefully you can see all that. So this is a, a, a wonderful, colorful autumn moth, um, green brindled crescent. Hopefully you can see there, it's got some lovely colors of green in the middle of the wing. It's got a bit of white and very nice sort of chestnut brown. It's got a, a bit of a Mohican uh, haircut going on on the top of its body. Um, so this is a common species uh, throughout Scotland. Um, it, it, it's an autumn species, so it's on the wing in um, April, uh, sorry, in uh, September, October. Um, that's when the females are laying their eggs and it overwinters as an, um, the caterpillars feed primarily on the leaves of deciduous trees particularly on things like hawthorn and blackthorn, um, rowan and apple. Um, as I say, it's common throughout most of Scotland. The further north you go, um, it becomes much scarcer. And as far as I'm aware, it doesn't occur out on the outer isles. So you, you're not gonna find it on Orkney, Shetland or the, or the Western Isles. So that's, uh, that's green brindled crescent. Here's my next moth. Again, I'm sorry, it's a, a little bit small. Hopefully you can all see that. This is uh, a chestnut. Now I've been catching quite a few chestnuts. Um, again, a, a common species, common throughout Scotland. They can be quite variable. Um, they overwinter as an adult. There's another one that I've just dropped in onto the, onto the wee bit of cardboard that hopefully you can see. Um, so what's interesting with chestnuts is that they're on the wing now, sort of September, October, maybe into November. They overwinter as an adult, um, but then they come out of hibernation in the spring. And that's actually when they then mate and, and the females then lay their, their eggs. So a different strategy to the green brindled crescent. Um, similar to the green brindled crescent, the caterpillars are feeding on uh, the leaves of trees. There we just to show that it is a live moth. There it is moving. Um, so it's feeding on the leaves of trees, on things like blackthorn again, um, birch, hawthorn, oak. Um, but then after it's fed on the, the fresh leaves, the very fresh leaves, just as they're emerging in the spring, once it's fed on those and they probably get a little bit tougher, they then, the caterpillars then tend to come off the trees and feed on herbaceous plants beneath the tree. So they might be feeding on things like dandelion and docks. So that's the, uh, that's the chestnut. The next moth is being very well behaved. This is the angle shades, um, hopefully a species that's very, very familiar to everybody. I always think that it looks a bit like the Batmobile because the wings are very crumpled. Presumably the adults are trying to mimic a dead leaf. Um, it tends to be uh, on the wing. Well, it's on the wing in, in the UK almost uh, any month of the year. So, but in Scotland, to me, I tend to see the adults more in sort of August, September, October, even into November. Um, it, it is a really, really wonderful species. Um, I think there's some evidence that in Scotland, it, it's probably a migrant. And in good years like this year, when there have been a number of migrants arriving into Scotland, I do find that uh, angle shades is far more common. And again, just like the other species, um, I caught maybe about a dozen angle shades on my sugar and on my wine ropes, and I only had one in the moth trap. So it really shows that, that going out and, and, and sugaring and wine roping can be really, really good. And even on really poor nights, you, you, can, still get, uh, you can still get moths. So this uh, angle shades, it overwinters as a caterpillar. And it's also one of the caterpillars you can often regularly find in the garden. I, I get sent quite a few mystery caterpillar photos. And if it's people who've been in their garden and they're sending you a nice photo of a normally a fairly plain green caterpillar, it tends to be of, angle, of an angle shades. Um, they overwinter as a caterpillar. Um, and the caterpillars aren't particularly fussy. They'll eat almost anything, particularly herbaceous uh, um, plants. So again, a bit like the chestnut, it will be feeding on you know, 
dockens and dandelions and, and things like that in, in your garden. So let's see what else we have here. Well, this is probably the, the highlight of what, what I caught. Uh, let's see if it will behave. Drum roll, please. So it's not quite behaving, but uh, this moth here, it's, uh, I'll try and I'll, I'll leave it as it is for now, and then I'll move it in a, in a little while. This is a pearly underwing. So it has, as the name suggests, uh, very pale white underwings. It's quite a large moth. It's an irregular immigrant. There aren't looking at the distribution map, but there's not that many records in Scotland. They're fairly spread throughout, but tend to be more in the, uh, in the east. You can see here, hopefully, that one of the ways that you can identify it is that it has this sort of paler Mohican crest along the top of its head, because it can look very, very similar to the turnip moth and to dark sword grass. Dark sword grass is also another uh, migrant. So I'm going to see whether it will behave itself so that you can actually see the patterns on, on its uh, wing. It's fairly plain. Oh, there we go. It's well, slightly better behaved. Um, but you can see there that uh, uh, towards the end of the wing, there aren't any, on the, there's a very faint paler band. And if that was dark sword grass, then in that paler band, there will be little thin wedges, very thin wedges that would be quite obvious in that paler band. So uh, pearly underwing doesn't have that, um, but it also has that uh, very obvious paler crest on the back of its head. Um, so they're, the, they're the, the, the different moths that I, that I caught last night. So uh, sadly, just uh, yeah, there's just five species there. Um, yes, we, we'll have to make sure that Nigel doesn't uh, book his holiday uh, you know, when we're having this. The only other thing that I can show you while you're here is I've brought in my um, wine ropes. So those of you that want to go wine roping, this is what you do. So I have here, this is an old uh, paint pot. And you see in here, there's a wonderful aroma, fantastic aroma of wine coming out of here. So what I have done is it's a bit like making um, mulled wine. You, you go to somewhere like Old Day or Liddles and you buy the cheapest uh, bottle of Plonk you can. And if you put it on your stove and warm it up and then just get a bag of white sugar and mix it together, uh, get the sugar to dissolve in the wine. And then as you'll see here, I've got some sisal or you can use a cord or sash. And the great thing with this is that you can then take this out and you can lay it on the ground. You can put these uh, bits of sisal. Uh, I hang mine over a wee netting fence that I've got. Um, if you're out in uh, sites like uh, sand dunes, it works very, very good. You can just put it on, uh, on or out on open heather moorland. You can just rest it on the top of, uh, uh, of the heather. And it, it, doing things like this, it's very, very fickle. Some nights, uh, wine roping can be incredibly productive. You know, I, I've caught 40 or 50 moths on wine ropes in a night, but a lot of the time um, it just doesn't work. And it's very difficult to know whether it's going to work uh, on any particular night or not. What I do find is that if you wine rope or sugar regularly, the more regular you do it, the moths tend to, I think they, the, the scent probably hangs in the air and you, it tends to work better. Um, so yet yeah, give it a go. The, the thing though with wine roping is that uh, you have to be up in the evening to check your wine ropes. It's not like a moth trap. You can't just get up at uh, dawn or in the early hours uh, and uh, see what's on your, um, what you've caught. You have to go out. And what I tend to find is that uh, just after dusk, uh, you'll get a few moths. And if you're starting to get a few moths coming in, then if you keep going out every half an hour, you might catch a few more. Normally, if you're not getting any on the first few nights, the first few, uh, first 30 minutes or so of dusk, then you tend not to, to get any for the rest of the night.
So that's that's wine roping. I've not got any sugar with me, but sugar is a very similar concept. You go and buy a bottle of uh, brown ale or dark beer, some brown sugar and some black treacle. You mix it all together on the stove and you get a very thick treacly mixture and then you paint that on fence posts. And that, that works very well as well. And you'll then hopefully be able to catch, you know, species like pearly underwing or uh, red sword grass, you know, some of the things that I've shown you uh, today. So um, I think that's probably it from me. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't catch any more moths. Um, yet yeah, hopefully in the spring when we have our recorders gathering, um, we'll get Nigel back and uh, yeah, he can uh, show us lots of moths. So uh, thank you for listening. And I'll hand you back to Epiphany. Great, thank you, Tom. Uh, even though you didn't have many moths, they were very nice ones. So thank you very much for that. And it was really great that you showed us the the uh, wine roping as well, because I bet a lot of people hadn't seen that before. And I've also put a link to some instructions about it on the BC website in the chat. Okay, so uh, next up we have some Scottish survey updates. Now, I'm not actually sure whether it's David or Polly who's going to be speaking first, but I'm sure they're going to give us a great summary of survey work and perhaps tell us how you can get involved as well. Hi, David. Thanks very much, Pisney. Yes, I'm going to go first and then I will hand over to Polly. Right, so I am just going to start by going through quite quickly, because I've only got 10 minutes, survey updates for the Northern Brown Argus and the Pearl Boring Fertility from the surveys we've been holding this year. And then I am going to hand over to Polly, who will do something similar for um, large heath. So starting with the Northern Brown Argus, this is one of our most under pressure butterflies in Scotland. Very sadly, as we all know, our species rich grasslands have long been going down the pan. And the Northern Brown Argus relies on our species rich grasslands, particularly those in the uplands and coastal areas as this is where the butterfly is found. Without good quality species rich grasslands, the butterfly will suffer. Now, down in the Scottish borders, a few years ago, Barry Prater, who we've heard about earlier and his award, very much deserved Barry, kicked off um, on Northern Brown Argus because he was quite worried about how the species was doing. So him and lots of other volunteers in the borders over the last few years have been surveying sites and this is where they are at the moment. So the yellow dots, sorry, the orange dots that you can see, these are sites that have been surveyed and sites in blue have not been surveyed yet. So about 90% of sites in the borders have been surveyed and there's 170 of them. So that's a phenomenal rate of going over the last few years. Um, and what the surveys have shown is that about 50% of all the colonies in the borders are under threat from some kind. Um, bracken and scrub are big issues, but particularly in the borders of forestation and creation of new woodlands is really putting pressure on the butterflies as pockets of species rich grassland get planted up. Um, so this is obviously really concerning, but the surveys that Barry initiated have been so successful in the borders that we've been really keen to push these out to other areas of Scotland where Northern Brown Argus is present. And the survey is really quite simple. Is really asking three things of people who get involved. So we ask you to visit a site where Northern Brown Argus is known, and we ask you to look for common rock crows. Can you find any? Can you find Northern Brown Argus, either the butterfly or its eggs? And crucially, can you tell us where the rock crows and the Northern Brown Argus were? And are there any threats to its habitat? So can you see scrub coming in? Is there a new woodland being planted? That kind of thing. And once we get that data in, we're able to do this, and that's create maps. So we can map out exactly where the habitat is that the butterfly is using. And this is crucial, and it's for the first time ever we can do this for a species in Scotland. And this allows us to plan conservation work and work with other bodies and hopefully avert woodland plantings um, directly onto Northern Brown Argus habitat. So this last year and uh, this year, we tried to expand the survey out into new areas. So one of these areas was Tayside. Um, so you can see here, um, you see my cursor in the Sidlaw Hills last year, lots of surveys were undertaken. Um, and this year up in the Tummel and Loch Rannoch areas. 
Now, Paratir and Tayside is really, really important area for Northern Brown Argus. It's a bit of a stronghold. There are a lot of colonies, and you can see there's lots of blue dots still, so there's lots of survey opportunities for people to get involved. Initially, the results in Tayside indicate um, from about a third of colonies that have been surveyed so far, about 40% of those have some threat to their survival. Um, bracken and scrub are big issues. Um, but what's also clear is that rock, uh, there's a lack of rock rows at a lot of sites. So there's potentially some opportunities here for us to do some conservation work. Happily, so far, the threat of woodland plantings in pasture doesn't seem to be as big as it is in the borders, but there's still lots of surveys to be carried out. And there's, yeah, we, we need to find out more basically about Northern Brown Argus in pasture. Moving up to Baynock and Strath's Bay. So you can see up here, all of these beautiful orange dots are sites that were surveyed just this year. Almost every site in, in, in between Aviemore and uh, the Granton area has been done, and that's mostly thanks to Pete Moore and his team of wonderful volunteers um, up in that area. You'll see down in the, uh, a bit further up the Strath, up towards Kinesi, that there's been less surveys done. It's a shame there's not um, somebody who knows a bit about butterflies that lives in Kinesi, really, but yeah, maybe we'll do something about that one day. Um, moving on to the results. So, well, firstly, look at this picture on the right. Look at all these wonderful eggs um, on a photo taken by Hilary Swift in Glen Tromey. That's amazing. I've never seen so many eggs on one bit of rock rooms. Um, several new colonies have been added to the maps for Bain Knock and Strath's Bay, so that's another thing. There's lots of new sites can be found for Northern Brown Argus if you get out there looking, particularly following up on, on where rock rose has been recorded, but not the butterfly. Um, about a third of sites have got some kind of threat reported to them on space, space side, and mostly that seems to be um, small numbers of rock rose plants again. Um, so this is the situation for the whole of Scotland at the moment. There are 548 known or suspected Northern Bernard's colonies, um, according to um, what I've managed to map out. And so far, 260 of these have been surveyed. So that's a phenomenal effort, and it's almost halfway. I mean, 548 is a large number. So to get even halfway is amazing, really. Um, and we've got help coming. So we will be employing, as Epiphany mentioned earlier, new project officers through the Species on the Edge Partnership Project, which will enable us to carry out surveys on the coastal areas in Aberdeenshire, up here in um, Easter Ross, and down here on the Solway. So help is arriving, but if you would like to get involved in these surveys, that would be fantastic. Um, and I've also got a couple of gold stars to hand out, and these are to do with gardening. So. Um, Kirsty Swales, a volunteer this year who got involved with Northern Brown Argus surveys in Strath's Bay, went out, surveyed some sites, um, sent in some wonderful reports, and then she was sat in her garden one day, and lo and behold, she saw a Northern Brown Argus. She thought, oh, hang on, I've got rock rose planted, went and had a look, and the, the rock rose was covered in eggs. Amazing. And just um, a bit further up the Strath, Mike Taylor also found um, Northern Brown Argus and eggs on his rock rose in his garden. So it just goes to show that if you plant it, they will come. Um, and both of these were cultivars of rock rose bought from garden centres locally. And the, the cultivar was um, Ben Fada. So yeah, those, gar those of you with gardeners that are living in Northern Brown Argus areas, there's an opportunity there to um, plant some rock rose and see if you can get some Northern Brown Argus in your garden. A similar story down here in Stirling, or near Stirling as well, um, one of our supporters um, planted, um, was, she was in her garden and she noticed a northern brown argus. She lives near the Ockles, where northern brown argus is known. She thought, oh, that's interesting. Again, she found eggs on rock rows that were planted in the garden. She then went up the hill behind her house and found northern brown argus eggs on rock rows on the hill behind. And this was particularly interesting because whilst the butterfly is known in the Ockles, um, it hasn't been recorded on Dumaya, which is a well-known hill, um, for well over 100 years. Back in the 19th century, Dumaya was renowned as being the best place in central Scotland to find the butterfly. Um, but it hasn't been seen there for many, many, many years. 
So for it to turn up again is incredible. It's probably been there the whole time. It's um, quite an unfrequented part of, of what's usually a very busy hill. But the butterfly has been shown to be there again. And it's also in Stirlingshire, which is the first record in Stirlingshire for many, many years as well. So it can be re-added to the Stirlingshire butterfly list. So happy days and well done to those volunteers for spotting them in their gardens. Moving on to pearl border fritillary. So this is another species which is um, under pressure and it's a species of woodlands. Um, it's a spring butterfly, so it's seen in May. Um, and it really requires lots of violets growing in woodlands and on open hillsides. Um, and it's got a real requirement for bracken. Not too much bracken, but just enough bracken. Some of you will remember um, that the butterfly was found at Loch Katrin um, a few years ago, which was a real turn up. Well, it was a real um, fantastic find because we've been looking there for it for a very long time. It used to be known around Loch Katrin, but hadn't been seen for years. Um, this year, we were very fortunate that a PhD student called Jess Burrows was able to join us on secondment. Jess was able to carry out a study on the butterflies that have been found, or the small colonies that have been found over the last few years um, during um, surveys, um, and it's um, carried out by Nick Cook and Butterfly Conservation Volunteers with the support of Forestry and Land Scotland. So Jess went out to these colonies that have been discovered, and we got her to focus on where the butterfly was laying its eggs. So she spent her days wandering around, following female butterflies, seeing where they were egg laying. And this is crucial because we've never done this before in Scotland. And pearl borer fertilities and where they lay their eggs is really interesting because we can use that to tell us exactly the exact micro habitat that the butterfly needs. And then we can use that to hopefully influence what conservation management we can carry out. So it's really exciting to get a study like this done in Scotland. And the results indicated um, that it matched up quite nicely with the results that Jess and others had found in previous studies in Cumbria. That the butterfly likes to lay its eggs in areas that are rich in violets, perhaps not too surprising, and areas where the bracken just isn't too dense. So um, bracken density is something that has increased a lot in Scotland in recent years, we think. It's perhaps influenced by climate change and other and um, things that are going on in our uplands, other changes in land management. So it's really interesting that it's confirmed that what we thought was true, that the butterfly likes lots of violets, but not necessarily where the bracken is too dense. It just needs a bit of bracken, not too much. So hopefully we can use this wonderful new knowledge to help us manage sites for power fertility across Scotland. And in particular, we're gonna try and work with Forestry and Land Scotland to see if we can improve the habitats that are there at Loch Caption. But in conjunction with that study that Jess was running, we also ran a wider study across Scotland, um, encouraging people to get out and have a look at lots of pearl border fertility colonies. So um, Jess sat at a computer for ages and mapped out all the pearl border fertility colonies that we have in Scotland. Um, there's a lot, several hundred. And we selected around 100 of these as priorities because these were sites where the butterfly hasn't been seen for a few years, sometimes as much as 25 or 30 years. And the surveys aimed to record pearl border fertility and just evaluate the habitat using a simple form. We ran a few training workshops um, and fortunately we had quite a lot of people attend. Now the last pearl border fertility Scotland in Power Fertility Survey in Scotland that was widespread was way back in 1997. So I was barely at secondary school then, so it was a very, very long time ago. And well, I'll just share quickly some of the results. I'm not fully crunched all the data yet, but there was a new site turned up to Power Fertility um, on the shores of Loch Ness that was found by Steve Wheatley. That was very exciting. Steve also went up Glen Affric and recorded the first pearl borer fertilities in the Glen since 2010, which is incredible as Glen Affric is really quite an important landscape for pearl borer fertilities. There's quite a number of colonies. So for it not to be seen there for 12 years was really surprising. Hopefully they're all still there and doing fine. It's just a lack of recording. 
but Steve did find um, some at the sites that he visited. Um, down in Glen Spean, at the wonderfully named hamlet of Achloachrach, um, Pearl War Artillery was found um, by a volunteer doing a survey um, at exactly the same place where it had last been recorded way back in 1997. There was lots of surveys done over in Deeside, most of which were successful, which is great. Um, down in Perthshire, the butterfly turned up in a wood um, near Pit Lockery for the first time since 1998, uh, another survey by one of the volunteers. And um, slightly further south in Perthshire, at Ben Lores, the butterfly was recorded again. It was only first confirmed there by our very own Anthony McCluskey five or six years ago, so it was great that it's still surviving there. Now, out in the west, during May time when the Pearl War of Tilly is flying, the weather was absolutely rubbish. Um, the west coast of Scotland is a really important area for pearls, um, so it was quite a shame that the weather um, really curtailed a lot of surveys. But the, from the surveys that were done, the butterfly was seen at a few sites. Um, but there's much, much, much more to do with Pearl War fertility. Um, so 57 surveys were carried out this year, um, probably affected by the weather, unfortunately, but we will be running the survey again next year, and there's lots of opportunities to get involved right across Scotland, Deeside, Perthshire, Strathspey, lots of areas of the West, and down in Dumfries and Galloway too, where we didn't have any surveys carried out this year. So plenty of opportunities to get involved. Um, if you would like to get involved for surveying Northern Bernargus or Pearl Border Fertility, then please do get in contact with me. We'll be advertising our surveys again in the spring. Thanks very much, and I will hand over to Polly. Thanks, David. As many of you will know, um, it's our only bog specialist um, on peat bogs, um, being found on blanket and lowland raised bogs across Scotland. Uh, but of course, due to the increasing number of bogs that are drying out and becoming degraded, uh, this butterfly is in decline across the whole of the UK. And, you know, it's probably under-recorded, um, due to it being found in the more remote places, places perhaps that people don't tend to spend that much time, um, and they tend to be far more challenging terrain. Now, I'm hoping that there aren't any volunteers left out there, but as far as I know, everybody came back, um, which was great. So some years ago, we identified um, lowland raised bogs that also had large heath records. And then from that, we put together a list of priority bogs based on how recent um, was the last confirmed sighting and do we know anything about the habitat condition of that bog. Um, and this has given us a list of 53 priority bogs that we're keen to learn more about um, this year. And so you can see that on our red spots on this map. So based on that, we rolled out the survey, um, which I think is the first time we've sort of rolled out a big um, survey for large heath, which is great. Um, and we were basically wanting to know um, much more about the distribution and the abundance and whether it's presence or absent from the bogs where people were going out and surveying. And then the second part of the survey is that we really wanted to know much more about the habitat condition of these bogs um, and basically looking out for positive indicators for the large heath. Um, so they would be things like um, hare's tail, cotton grass or cross-leaved heath, which are important for the life cycle of the butterfly. And then looking for negative indicators um, for the large heath. So that would be things like encroaching scrub on the bog um, or areas that are dominated with ling heather. We were able to do some training sessions, both online and actual two field training days. So thanks ever so much um, to Leadburn Community Woodland and for South Lanarkshire Council for hosting us at those two events which were attended uh, well. 
So a few headline results here then. Um, and as you can see, the red spots here are those bogs that weren't surveyed this year. But the blue ones were surveyed, but we didn't find any large heath at those sites. Um, and the green ones is where we did find large heath. So um, we got quite a nice um, uptake um, across the central belt there. That don't know whether that's got anything to do with the fact the field days were in the central belt. Um, so that might be something to think about for next year. So 19 volunteers um, surveyed 21 bogs, um, 11 of which had large heath found on them, and 15 of the priority bogs were also surveyed with a habit, sort of habitat condition report. In addition to that, um, you know, it's not just the priority bogs we're interested in all, all bogs. So we had six non-priority bogs that were also surveyed as well. Now, because we don't have a lot of time, I've just gone into detail in um, one area, which is North and East Ayrshire priority bogs, which there were four of them that we can see here. Um, as you can see, bloke moss had the greatest abundance of large heath for any of the priority bogs that have been surveyed this year um, with 37. Um, so well done, Scott Shanks, for that. That was a really good day you had. Um, Ockintyber and Dyke Nuke were interesting because these were last confirmed sightings um, from the 1990s. So um, Gordon Phillips was able to, you know, show us that they're still there. They've probably always been there, but um, we just hadn't had any confirmed records. So that's fantastic news. And Dunmoss, again, um, high numbers um, here, which was good. And I'll come back to Dun Moss again. But over all the 11 priority bogs, we were find we found 89 individuals. So habitat condition um, sort of still needs to do um, a bit more number crunching there, looking into it on a bog by bog basis, really using the abundance data. The comments that you're putting in the questionnaires are really useful to give us an idea of the condition as well, as well as these photos. So this photo from Kirsty Menzies on Dun Moss, um, great, um, because even though we got 12 and 12 large heath on your survey, we can still see that it's covered with, it's got this lovely um, sporting a rash of Sitka um, and that is something that perhaps we can be looking at um, to inform future conservation action that we can do. Um, I suppose the headlines were that most of the bogs, unsurprisingly, were very dry. Um, obviously, we were going out um, in the driest part of the year. It was really, really hot, um, June and July. Three bogs did fare better, um, seemed to have less scrub and being wetter. So those are North Shots, Carnworth and, and White, Boss, White Moss in the borders. Um, but a lot, these bogs seem to be, um, the majority of the bog entirety seems to be quite dry, um, encroaching uh, scrub, heather, tussock with these small patches um, where the large heath um, can hang out. So there's obviously loads of scope for restoration. Um, so it's early days. And, and obviously, as I say, these this can inform our locations for future bog squad work that we do. So next year, we going to be running it again because it's it, as I say it is early days for this particular survey um, so we will look and see you know there might be some bogs that come off the priority list um, we just haven't found large heath there such as Wim bog um, that I know Reuben and John um, have been surveying for us thank you um, but we'd love to recruit some more volunteers it would be great um, to get um, people perhaps particularly in Dumfries and Galloway again um, to have a look and see um, uh, what's going on for particularly habitat condition of these bogs. Um, so really more of the same for next year but I really want to 
to thank um, you so much for all the hours um, that you took um, taking to survey the raised bogs over the summer. Um, I know it was, it was a really hot summer. There was no shade. You had to contend with flies, barbed wire, fences, mountainous tussocks and hidden holes. And so we're really grateful um, for all of you that did go out and take part in this survey. And we'd love you to do it again. Um, May thanks to Peatland Action for their funding and support. And if you still have any of your surveys and sightings that you haven't given in, please do send them back in to um, myself there. And um, hopefully we will have another survey season next year. Thank you. I will stop sharing now. Thank you very much, David and Polly. I think you're both doing great work in mobilizing volunteers and getting them out doing these really important surveys. Okay, so I am very intrigued by our next talk because Colin didn't want to give too much away. All I know is that he lives in Highland Branch and he's quite a new uh, volunteer at BC. So we're getting the perspective of, of a beginner and uh, welcome Colin. I'm really glad that you've come to talk to us today. Okay, thank you very much, Epiphany. Um, excellent, thank you. Okay, um, yes, I mean, um, thank you all. Anthony asked me to give uh, this bit of a talk, re really looking at um, engaging with butterfly conservation from a, an absolutely uh, standing start. I'm conscious there's many volunteers in the audience here who've um, done much more than I, but but it was to look at it from the point of view of just uh, really, really uh, the start of a journey. Um, so the, uh, sorry, my, this is acting up a little bit. Um, so uh, that's me looking uh, windswept and interesting up on um, Cairngorms National Park. I, I retired in um, March 2020 with volunteering very much on my agenda. Um, I, what I didn't realise was that that would coincide with the start of the first lockdown, um, which was uh, challenging for us all. Um, but I, we, we got through it. Um, a lot of opportunities to look at my uh, local nature and wildlife. But as soon as the lockdown end, ended, um, I was very fortunate. We, we have uh, two uh, caravans in Scotland, one over on the Argyle coast um, and one up on uh, Speyside there, um, which, as you see, are a priority is for landscape, uh, sorry, for uh, butterflies, um, but also for every other kind of nature um, and very uh, precious areas to me too. Um, that's my view in Argyll, um, which is uh, pretty spectacular, as I think you'll agree. Um, and that's my view in Strispey, uh, literally out of the, the window. Um, my very, once uh, when the lockdown started, it was really autumn 21 before volunteering got back in any shape or form, as I'm sure you know. And uh, my very first opportunity was with uh, um, the team up there at uh, Inch Marshes. And we were engaged in looking at uh, a improving the habitat by clearing birch scrub to let the aspen come through for the, the larvae for the dark water beauty mods. Um, it was a great day, um, heavy going, some hard work, um, but we did uh, a good exercise and it introduced me to, um, well, for a start, a couple of lads, uh, uh, Pete Moore and uh, Tom Prescott, that will be well known to you all, um, but also to the wonderful Inch Marshes, um, which is an area that I've gone on to uh, come to know even more Um as as things have gone on and time has progressed uh, it's a spectacular area um a pretty mysterious and moody and uh one of the the, the great things about volunteering on any um sort of long-term basis is a chance to see things through the seasons and see things change and evolve um so you kind of take the the rough if you like uh, with the, the very smooth um, back in the summertime. I, the opportunity to see things appear uh, as, as spring kicks in. 
um, to see them grow and uh, obviously help them flourish and try and track uh, progress as, as it goes. Um, you get to meet a lot of new friends, I, I, some of them uh, human. Um, the girl on the far right there, incidentally, is Kirsty Swales. It was mentioned in David's presentation a moment ago. Uh, some new friends, not so human. Um, these are the conic ponies that help with the grazing and meadow creation on the reserve. Um, yep, I guess I say really hard work. I, I can assure you the old bones were creaking a bit after lifting and placing all those logs. Um, the fences there are to keep uh, the wild cats in, not those people. Um, some of the work's a bit more sedentary, involves monitoring uh, trail cameras, which can be pretty spectacular. I never fails to throw up surprises. That's the first water vole recorded on the marshes for quite some time. Um, always little treats, always little delights. That was back in the springtime. Uh, but sometimes the treats are actually uh, for others. Anyway, back to butterflies and, and moths. That is the um, first area that we worked on that I mentioned just at the beginning there. And that's a year on. I took that photo a few weeks back. Uh, and um, you'll be delighted to see the, the aspens coming through and flourishing and hopefully benefiting the moths. Um, on to winter time, I am a wee bit more desk bound, but Anthony asked me to get engaged in uh, the volunteer programme, um, looking at helping with uh, running trips and education and getting community involved, which has been fascinating. Um, into the winter, again, I, outside work, that's one of um, the meadow creation exercises that Anthony mentioned uh, I, in Rock Hill Park, right here in Glasgow. Um, clearing away the, uh, uh, the, the cut grass um, to improve the meadows and improve habitat for, for all manner of um, butterflies. The, uh, into springtime and up to uh, Western Moss up at uh, Flynn Bing. Um, that's a good photo. It shows the, the moss, uh, which is obviously a butterfly site. And again, um, involved in uh, birch scrub clearance to let the bird's foot trefoil come through um, and the various species that that would benefit. Uh, Falin Bing is actually a lovely little site, a good, a good example of um, community history, community engagement as well, uh, all linked to nature conservation. And um, yeah, I advise MD to have a wee visit or a wee Google if you're interested. Uh, even closer to home, um, we went out and uh, this was my first uh, day leading as a facilitator under the volunteer um, arrangement. Um, we were looking on uh, literally about half a mile from my home. Turns out Lenzie Moss, our local reserve, is a stronghold for um, a, a green hair streak there. Um, we didn't actually get any green hair streak on the day. Um, I think we were just about a week too late. Um, but we did get a, a nice crowd of folk and we were able to show them a few wee highlights such as uh, micro moths and things and just generally uh, help, uh, help the interest. Uh, back up to uh, Stress Bay in the summer, um, and uh, as you've heard already, out looking for the pearl bordered frets, um, and we found one. Uh, that's actually my photo. Uh, I think we found a couple, Tom. Um, so that's my photo and evidence that we we got one, which was uh, delightful. Uh, still in the summertime. Um, Strath Bay again, just up above Aviemore, we went out and looked for uh, the larva of the emperor moth, um, which again uh, is successful and nice to know they're still there and thriving. I autumn and it was back out to Argyll. This is um, a habitat for uh, the marsh uh, fruits, which we were having a look for the larva at this time of year. And again, um, happily found them. Maybe not as many as I might have liked, but uh, but they were there. So so that's encouraging. Um, the marsh fritz, as I'm sure you all know, is is under all manner of of pressures. It needs extensive habitat and networks, um, without which it really struggles. Um, 
the uh, subject to a whole range of uh, protections. Uh, I won't read them out, but the, the length of the list alone um, tells you the kind of pressures that it's under. These are um, sites that Butterfly Conservation have done um, various surveys on. Um, and you'll see, uh, obviously, if you relate that to the earlier map, it's in uh, an area I'm very, very familiar with and very involved with. Um, and the uh, culmination of that trip with Tom was that he asked me actually to take on responsibility for uh, for um, five of those uh, sites actually going forward. Um, so I think that's maybe kind of the uh, a wee bit of the punchline to my talk in the space of um, literally almost exactly a year, uh, really having never heard of marsh fruits uh, or indeed of, of butterfly conservation, um, to be able to be part of uh, helping out one of uh, our most threatened um, uh, creatures is, is, is quite a privilege uh, and a testament to, to what can be done through butterfly conservation and the, the great team that's there. Um, so I uh, hopefully I haven't gone too much off track or off time. Um, thank you all for, for listening. Thanks for the opportunity to present. And, and thanks particularly to, to Anthony and Pete and Tom for just uh, an absolute ongoing uh, wealth of um, uh, knowledge and encouragement and experience and inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. That was it's lovely, actually, to see your, your BC journey and really nice photos as well. Inch Marshes is an amazing place. I went to see the Connick ponies recently and learn about them, and they're just fantastic, yep. hardy animals. Amazing. Yep. Um, we are quite short of time, but just for the benefit of any, any other beginners who are listening today, did you, when you started to volunteer, did you find out about these types of workshops and work parties? Did you get in touch with a staff member or did you find them on our website? Uh, how um, did you come across I, us? I think I was, I'm a bit fortunate up in the um, Cairngorms National Park because I think butterfly conservation there and the various um, groups and charities that are working kind of piggyback on the the, the volunteer program of the of the national park. Um, so it, it was very easy to to just log in, register, um, and then then see what opportunities coming up were coming up. And butterfly conservation was one that just happened to be one of the the first that came to the surface um but I, I would say i've had this conversation with a few people um it's really important for organizations like butterfly conservation to make it easy and accessible and, and simple for for folk to engage uh and and they do um some some groups uh less so uh and and some that i might have worked with have kind of fallen by the wayside a little bit just just because it's not easily accessible and, and and easy to share uh and and get the good out of so um yep in all in all aspects i have found butterfly conservation really straightforward to to link into and and hopefully make a wee contribution excellent well thank you it's, it's very nice to get some good feedback so i'm glad that you found it easy and thank you for your inspiring talk thank you okay so uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker. I'm really looking forward to this next talk by Rosemary because I think it's going to be another inspirational one. I believe it's pre-recorded, so I'm going to hand over to Anthony to share Rosemary's video. I'm going to be speaking about the flowers that we've been growing in Archiston to benefit um, butterflies and pollinators. Archiston is a small village on Speyside, there's about 100 houses, and it's an 18th century planned village with a main street, a north lane and a south lane, and then linking lanes. This area is um, renowned for its whisky distilleries, and so we have whisky barrel planters and hanging baskets, mainly up the main street and in the square. Each year we have a village lottery to raise money for flowers for the village. And we raise about a thousand pounds and then buy the flowers from a local nursery. They provide the hanging baskets ready planted 
and bedding plants, which the village garden group then plant. And they look after the water, watering the baskets and the tubs over the summer. Two and a half years ago, I enrolled on Anthony's butterfly ID course and learnt about flowers for butterflies and pollinators. I realised that the village flowers that we had were for show. The flowers last all summer, but there's no pollen or nectar. So I suggested to the village council that we include some flowers for pollinators and gave a list to the lady who orders the flowers. The village council thought this was a great idea and the nursery said they would provide some of these flowers. But when the time came, just the same flowers as usual arrived and were planted. However, all was not lost because I found five ceramic tubs in the pavilion and I set them up on Schoolhouse Lane, which is a side road leading to the play park. And it's one of the village walks. So a lot of people walk along this little lane. And uh, I planted that up with French marigolds. And uh, I also cleared the tubs at the play park, which were full of grass and weeds. And there I've grown forget-me-nots, calendula, French marigolds, nasturtiums, and pansies, all from saved seed. These were planted in the tubs, and as you can see, they're looking very beautiful this year. And interestingly, the pansies, which were from saved seed, were attractive to butterflies and pollinators. And I think it's because when you save the seed, they revert back to wild pansies rather than the F1 varieties that don't have the nectar or the pollen. This year, the nursery did not provide as many flowers as usual. I get, guess the cost had gone up. So there were gaps in some of the tubs. And this was an opportunity for me to grow and to plant uh, the flowers for the pollinators and the butterflies in those tubs. So I grew extra flowers and planted them in the gaps so that we had a mix of the plastic flowers and the flowers for the pollinators. And as you can see, it worked very well, and my extra flowers enhanced the looks of the tubs. So now I'm growing some perennials from seed, which I intend to plant in some of the tubs. Uh, and that way we won't need to grow so many annuals in the future. We joined the It's Your Neighbourhood scheme run by Keep Scotland Beautiful, and the assessor, who you can see here, uh, has been giving some very helpful advice uh, for perennials that we'll be able to grow in the tubs next year. In addition to the village tubs and hanging baskets, we've got gardens and this is my front garden which is on Main Street. A lot of people walk by and they stop to look at the garden. So I've planted a mix of wildflowers and cultivated, cultivated flowers for pollinators and for butterflies. We get a lot of bees and hoverflies and other insects, as well as butterflies and moths. And some of the butterflies we've had is, uh, this year have been the orange tip, peacock, tortoise shell. We've had a common blue and a small copper, which was really exciting, first time. Uh, we've also had speckled wood, green veined, small and large white, red admiral, and painted lady. And there's been occasions when I've been standing out the front speaking to neighbours when we've had a bee hawk moth and a silver Y, and I've been able to point them out to the neighbours I've been speaking to. So a lot of people stop and look, and if I'm out the front, I talk to them. And if they're interested, I show them around the garden and I give them plants and seeds for their own gardens. We have a village flower border just off the square and a lot of people walk along there too. Uh, so next year I'm intending to plant perennial flowers for butterflies and for pollinators and to work on making that border similar to my own garden. We also have a play park and we have a little unused corner where we've established a wildflower meadow. We just started last year and we used collected seeds from uh, nature scot and wildflower seeds and we found that the plug plants seem to grow 
best, um, better than just trying to sow seeds directly. Uh, local volunteers clear and cut the grass and they plant the flowers. And we were very pleased to have a wide variety of flowers this year in the wildflower meadow. Here are some of them and there's more. So as you can see, we've had a lot of uh, wildflowers appearing in the meadow and very exciting. We've had our first orchid there as well. In addition, we've planted a native hedge. Um, the Woodland Trust provided the saplings as part of the Queen's Jubilee celebration, and they were planted by a team of volunteers in March this year. They include dog rose, crab apple, hawthorn, hazel, and dogwood, which will all benefit poll pollinators and butterflies. I also grew two rowan saplings, which we planted, and I put barrier tape around the wild raspberry cane so that they're not cut when the grass is cut. And this winter, I'm going to try growing geans from seed because the birds have been depositing a lot of the gean seeds in the garden. So three ways we've been growing flowers for butterflies and pollinators in Archiston. We've got the wildflower meadow. We've got my garden and other people's gardens. And we've got the village tubs. And uh, they've all been very successful in attracting butterflies and various pollinators into the village. Wow, uh, Rosemary, may I be the first to say what a beautiful cottage garden you have, absolutely lovely and what amazing work you've been doing. I think it's just such an important example because really this problem of, of bedding plants that aren't very good for pollinators is going on in just about every town and village across the UK. So you've been really proactive about it and done an amazing job. So well done and thank you from Butterfly Conservation. I'm just gonna have a quick check, see if we've got any questions. Um, no questions at the moment, but other people echoing my thoughts in the chat. Um, so I'd like to ask you quickly, how have other people in the village kind of responded to this? Have they have they really enjoyed these these wildflowers and pollinator friendly plants? And have they noticed, um, have they pointed out that they're seeing more butterflies? They're certainly very interested in, uh, I particularly noticed in the garden because I'm out working in the garden and they walk past and stop. In fact, I've had people wanting to take photos and uh, driving past in their car and stopping and taking a photo. Um, and my neighbor who's actually just got a building site next door, but um, we had a lot of uh, peacocks and, and, and other butterflies on the Budlia and they had a lot settling on their fence, just sunning themselves in the morning. And they were amazed at how many butterflies and were commenting on all the wonderful butterflies that they've got on their building site. You know, they haven't got a garden at all. But um, yeah, and I was asked to speak at the local ball group. That's a group for over 60s. Um, and I did a talk which Anthony gave me on flowers for butterflies. And uh, I took along seeds, either my own saved seed or wildflower seeds that I collected and gave them out to interested people at the end and they just mobbed me with wanting seeds for their garden um, and as I said people that are interested I've, I've given them shared you know my seeds with them um, they've been asking me uh, you know can you give me something for my garden as well um, so I know that those local people are very interested in growing flowers for themselves in, in their own gardens and wanting to see the butterflies and we've also had at least two people if not more than that sign up for Anthony's talks as well um, you know his online courses that he's done to learn about butterflies so it certainly has increased the interest in butterflies in our area and the village council is absolutely delighted because they're getting all these free flowers. Um, so they look on it as a money saving thing as well, you know, and, and I get other people growing flowers. It's not just myself. Uh, I got other folk involved in growing flowers for the tubs and those plug plants are very easy to grow. I've got 
even one packet of seed from Nature Scott of mixed flowers. And I just put a soil and leaf mold mix in the little cell trays and just put a little pinch of seed in each one. And um, I'm growing them on. I've got seven of those cell trays ready to plant out this autumn in the wildflower meadow. So we get a team of volunteers, you know, usually get about 20 people from the village coming along to help with the bigger things like the wildflower meadow or the tree planting, that sort of thing. And we've got uh, 15 people in the garden group as well. So, you know, for a little village of just 100 houses, about 200 people altogether, um, we feel we're, well, it's pretty good. <laughs> well, I think you should be very proud. I think that's amazing. And I hope some people feel inspired because this is definitely yeah. something that they could take and replicate in their own villages and towns. So thank yeah. you very much, Rosemary. And I think that you should go and read all of the comments in the chat box at the side because there's people mm -hmm. saying some really lovely things. So you should yeah. go and read those. I'd just like to say, you know, if, even if you've only got a very small garden, ours is a very small garden, you can do a lot. You know, you really can do a lot um, in just a small space and even a little small wildflower meadow makes a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. OK, so I think we're on to our last talk of the day. Yeah, it must be the last one because there's Tom just popped up on my screen uh, about to give his uh, his usual roundup of highlights from Scotland. Over to you, Tom. Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Yes, uh, sorry, it's me again. Um, I'm just uh, sharing my screen, just firing up my uh, talk. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this has become a bit of an annual event really for me, is that uh, in the autumn is to report back on the highlights of the butterflies and moths in Scotland. So I do this by uh, emailing all the uh, regional and vice county butterfly and moth recorders and I get completely inundated with news and sightings. And then I have the big problem of how I then condense that all down to a quick sort of 15, 20 minute talk. So uh, there's good that I could talk all well, probably all the way through to about five o'clock tonight with all the information that I've been given. So this is very, very much a personal uh, take on what I've considered the highlights and I've had to miss a huge amount out. So apologies for anything that people sent me they, they thought would warranted inclusion, but hasn't. So uh, let's make a start. So um, yes, butterflies. So was it a good butterfly year or not? Um, well, I think it was a good uh, butterfly year. Uh, it got off to a slow start because spring was very, very cold. Uh, the wonderful Tam Stewart, who uh, walks 10 transects, he had recorded this year, well, this was last week, an amazing 4,174 butterflies of 22 species on his transects. So that shows to me that it was a good year. Paul Kirkland from Dumfries and Galloway, he reckons that there were uh, twice as many records for things like dark green fertility, red admiral, speckled wood um, in D&G this year than last year. As always, there's winners and losers, and he reckoned the losers were Northern Brown Argus, Pearl Bordered Fertillery, Scotch Argus, Small Copper, Small Heath and Wall. And those had uh, less, um, let, well, tw uh, half as many records. Now, one way that uh, butterfly conservation sort of puts the finger on the pulse of how butterflies are doing each year is through the big butterfly count. And the big butterfly count results came out uh, yesterday. And in that, in Scotland, uh, the top, uh, the most commonly seen butterfly was small white, second meadow brown, then large white, ringlet and peacock. Now, the, again, as with everything, there's winners and losers, and some of the winners are shown here. So peacock was up by 243% on last year, red admiral by 135 and small tortoiseshell by 17%. So they're all our familiar garden butterflies doing well in Scotland. By contrast, those species all did all fared less well south of the border. Peacocks were down 5%, red admirals down 20%, small tortoiseshells down 13%. So a very mixed picture and uh, good for us to see that butterfly or those species are doing better in Scotland this year than they did south of the border. Although a little bit concerning is that common blue, this is a female common blue up in the top right hand corner, uh, 
they fared poorly this year in Scotland through big butterfly count. So they were down 13%, but in the rest of the UK as a whole, they were up 155%, so not doing so well. So this year was the 13th year of uh, big butterfly count, and in that time, there's been 9.6 million butterflies seen. Quite remarkable, uh, the, number of, uh, the number of sightings. Another winner with us is the comma. It continues to spread north. It was seen new for Easter Ross this year. Larvae were found in a Boyne. There were 19 records um, from the Highlands where it's really uh, beginning to get a stronghold. And here's a photograph of an egg um, taken by uh, Hilary Swift on some nettles in her garden. And according to, to Hillary, the way that you can tell that this uh, tiny egg that looks a little bit like a jelly mold with these ridges is comma and not red admiral is because there were uh, 11 veins, 11 of these little ridges on the, uh, on the egg. Uh, comma is supposed to have 10 to 11 of these veins, whereas red admiral has nine to 10 of these veins. So uh, the great thing I like about butterflies and moths is that every day is a school day. It's also nice to report back some success um, on some of the uh, habitat management we've been doing. This is Logie Quarry up near Tain, where we've been removing a lot of scrub with volunteers, but also with contractors through Highland Council's Nature Restoration Fund. This is a photograph of it this spring, uh, where we had a butterfly day for our volunteers and for the local community. And remarkably, there were, we counted on that day over 150 small blues and uh, about 30 dingy skippers. So they're obviously really faring well after that habitat management. Also, similar numbers were seen on the feshy, on some of the shingles on the, on the feshy, which is uh, yeah, really, really good news that some of the work that we're doing is making a difference. Now, this is river, these are some river shingles uh, close to Nairn. Uh, with lots of kidney vetch and Jen Tompkins, who's one of our volunteers, but is also the rare invertebrates in the Cairngorms project officer. She went to this site to look for small blue in June. Um, unfortunately, she was unable to find small blue, but while she was there, she photographed this little uh, colorful unicolorous micro moth. And uh, it was a bit unclear what this was. Uh, she sent the photo to Mike Taylor, and the view from him and Mark Young was that it was Silypha rufana. And this is actually new to Scotland. So it is amazing that when you're out there looking for these things, you can find such rarities. The nearest colony is in Cumbria on the limestones around sort of Morecambe Bay and the caterpillars feed on mouse ear hawkweed. Uh, Mike went back a few days later confirmed that small blue was at the site, but also found uh, um, you know, four or five uh, more of these adults to confirm its identity. So very exciting what, what, what can be found. We've mentioned before about small skipper spreading in Scotland. Um, it, it is, here's a map showing its distribution. Um, it's now found on the north coast of uh, Fife at Wormit. It's been seen now in, uh, in and around Lanarkshire. It's moved up in Stirlingshire. Glyn Edwards had one at Fallin Bing in July, and another one was found by Claire Martin uh, in a country park near Falkirk. And it's also been found in northeast Scotland. So way up here in, uh, in, a, in a wee village called Strawn. So it really, really is spreading. So a species that's doing very well, presumably due to climate change. Quickly mention holly blue, another species that we've discussed before that is doing well in Scotland and moving north. I was quite surprised when I saw this distribution map, just how um, common it was really in the central belt and further south and in Dumfries and Galloway. And it's continuing to, to march north. Again, it's, um, it's been found in uh, further north in Fife um, and it was, um, when we think that this sighting here just on the north coast of Fife is now the most northerly. So if you're living north of that, keep a lookout. It's very much a garden butterfly coming in where you've got holly and particularly ivy. So that, that's the holly blue. 
Now, clouded yellow is an immigrant butterfly. I've never seen one in Scotland. It tends to have uh, years. Normally every 10 years, they seem to erupt from the continent and can become quite common. It's a, they're a common sight down south uh, most years now. Uh, but this is the only record that we had this year. And this wonderful photograph was taken by Ian Cow. He was alerted to the presence of this butterfly by his brother where a uh, hundred yards from his house, there was a leak field where there were lots and lots of small whites flying around. And his brother had noticed this uh, yellow butterfly. So uh, Ian went out straight away, he dashed out, it was a cool day and he saw this uh, and was able to approach this uh, female clouded yellow. This was on the 17th of, uh, of September. So uh, it's good to know that there's still some brotherly love in, in the cow family. Um, white letter hair streak. Uh, this was first recorded as a Scottish butterfly in 2017. I remember doing this highlights then, just showing uh, a single sighting, literally just over the border, just over the River Tweed at Paxton. Uh, so that was what, five years ago? Wonderful, wonderful adult here on the left. These are Ian Cow's photos. Here's some eggs. The butterfly is associated with elm. So where are we now, five years later? We'll have a, have a look at this map. You can see the border there just about between England and Wales and all those blue uh, symbols are records of white letter hair streak. So there's 18 10 kilometer squares in there. Four of those were new added this year. Uh, the emphasis now is trying to get these records at a higher resolution and trying to target uh, one kilometer squares within the 10 kilometer squares. So it's very much a work in progress. Now, some of these sites, good numbers of butterflies have been seen, 50 to 100. Um, so it really, really is present. Uh, often though, they're only seen in ones and twos. So it's been as, seen as far uh, west as uh, Denham Mill uh, near uh, Hoyk, so right down here. And it's been seen as far north um, as Houndwood. So they must be elsewhere. So this is a plea from Ian to, to get people out there to look for white letter hair streak. So, so go and look for your elm and then look for white letter hair streak. Another success story of, uh, of a species doing very well in Scotland, although we're not sure whether this is due to under-recording or to natural spread, is purple hair streak. Now, Chris Stamp has been doing some amazing work trying to encourage people out to, to look for for this butterfly, it flies around the tops of, of oaks in sort of uh, July and August. And this amazing photograph was taken by Hannah Shell. Now, Hannah um, is getting into her butterflies and moths. She, she goes around with her camera and takes a few photos. And every so often, she then sends these to Barry Prater in the borders to identify. So it's normally moths, but uh, amongst a batch of photographs that she sent to um, Barry in the beginning of August this year was this uh, wonderful photo of uh, purple hair streak that she took on the 15th of July. So that is the first confirmed record of purple hair streak in the borders uh, in Berwickshire. It was found at the River Whiteadder near Abbey, Abbey St. Bathan. Uh, Jeff and Gail Ballinger from Edinburgh went down because they're great purple hair streak hunters. And uh, they sped down from Edinburgh and uh, looked in the area and almost immediately were rewarded with sightings of purple hair streaks flying over the oaks um, at locations close to where Hannah had photographed this. This spurred them on and they made further finds up the A1 at Pease Bridge and Dunglass Bridge, all just within uh, Berwickshire. And then they also recorded at Woodhall Dean, the first ever purple hair streak for East Lothian. So here's a map. The Purple areas show the distribution of the butterfly prior to this year, and you can see those sort of orangey brown areas, new areas where the butterfly was recorded this year. So here are the new sightings in Berwickshire, the new ones in East Lothian and Edinburgh. But if you look to the north, uh, Patrick Cook in the spring found eggs of uh, purple hair streak on wind blown um, oak twigs that are blown off the trees to show these were the very, very first records of purple hair streak in, uh, in Deeside. Subsequent to that, people went and looked 
and then found other areas in Deeside where, where purple hair streak was, was found. And recently, Peter Stronach uh, recorded purple hair streak just up from the road from me at Kinrara, which is just south of Abbeymoor. He had five there fly, flying around the oaks there. So um, amazing that this butterfly is now being recorded very regularly away from uh, you know, its known haunt. So it's about a 40 kilometre increase in its range to the north. Checkered Skipper, this was mentioned by Paul, its first confirmed sighting on uh, Mull. It's been thought to have been on Mull for a few years with a few records, but it's never been confirmed. This was Chris Ostick who, who took this photograph of uh, in a woodland just near Craig Muir on the 30th of May. Um, so that's extending it onto Mull here, but also Pete and Hillary, they went to see whether Pete and uh, Pete Moore and Hilary Swift went to see whether they could find and extend the range of Checkered Skipper to the east. So their intention was to go along the A86 to Speen Bridge as far as Fursit and then start uh, heading east from there um, to look for it at new sites. They actually stopped for a cup of coffee a few miles before Fursit in a lay-by and lo and behold there was Checkered Skipper and they then started heading east towards Craig Meggie. They stopped in half a dozen laybys and recorded Checkered Skipper near each of those laybys. So they've now extended the range of Checkered Skipper by about 10 or 12 kilometers to the east. So it's not quite at the, at the Craig Meggie car park where the visitor center is, but it's not far off. So Checkered Skipper seems to be expanding its range. Portland moth, uh, these are uh, three Portland moths recorded by Nigel Voden from Tensmuir. Nigel and others have been looking to try and confirm that Portland moth is still at Tensmuir National Nature Reserve. So it's really, really good that um, you know it's been refound there. We we're beginning to get a little bit concerned because it's in similar habitat to grayling and grayling has been uh, declining quite rapidly and quite alarmingly at the site. So um, and Nigel was doing a lot of trapping there and he always thought that it was possible in Scotland to get 200 different moths in a single night. And he actually achieved it on this night on the 29th of July, uh, looking for uh, Portland moth when he recorded two and an amazing 214 different species. Portland moth is one of our priority species. Um, I and others have been looking for it along the Murray coast. Um, Duncan Davidson recorded it in Culbin, where it hadn't been seen for a few years. Um, it was also recorded by a visiting mother at Findhorn. It was refound at Fort George Rifle Range this year, where a single one was caught. It was last seen there in 2007. And also it turned up in somebody's trap near Abalawa, uh, the first record for Banffshire for many, many years. Presumably it's come off the River Shingles. So it's nice to, to note that, that we have recorded a uh, Portland moth year this year at uh, three or four different sites. This is quite a remarkable record of uh, small dark yellow underwing. Uh, as you can see here, the distribution of the moth is very much centered on the Cairngorms. This was actually found by um, Colin Edwards at a Forestry and Land Scotland site on a, on a raised bog uh, on the sort of Fife Perthshire border. And normally this moth is associated with Bearbury. As far as we know, there's no Bearbury on the site. Um, but there, there is um, cranberry, and cranberry is a known food plant of the caterpillars on the continent. So it'd be very interesting that uh, maybe this uh, moth is perhaps also, as well as being associated with dry heaths in the Cairngorms, it may well be on some of our lowland raised bogs, so worth looking out for. So quite a remarkable record. Now, what, what do people make of this moth? This was a photograph that was sent to me by Margaret Curry on the 3rd of August. It is quite obviously either a bordered beauty or a dark bordered beauty. There's a bordered beauty and there's a dark bordered beauty. Now, it doesn't quite fit either. Dark bordered beauty is a very, very rare species associated with aspen, only known from three populations in the Cairngorms. Bordered beauty is uh, associated willow. with willow. It's slightly more widespread. 
Um, the fact that it was found in Fort William, you'd have thought would rule out dark bordered beauty, and it just doesn't quite fit either. So what we think it is, is an aberrant uh, bordered beauty. You'll see that the border here, if it's bordered beauty, it, it for or the males, which this is, because you can see it's got feathery antennae, the border here runs more or less parallel to the edge of the wing, whereas with uh, bordered beauty, it goes to the tip, it, it cuts into the tip of the apex. Uh, the shape of the wing suggests that it is bordered beauty, the way that it's got this little, uh, this little sort of point at the end. So, and also that this inner line here is very square, and that is very, very clearly very similar to bordered beauty more than the more rounded dark bordered beauty. So it's really, really exciting. I always find that sort of these photographs like this that you get sent, you know, nothing, these moths haven't read the books. So what we think it is by the shape of the wing, the shape of the inner part of that line, um, we just think it's a, an aberration of uh, bordered beauty, but it's certainly got the heart racing for, for a wee while. This was a photograph taken last year of white barred clear wing here, new to Scotland. Um, it's one of our priority species. So uh, Mark Fubit returned to this site near Lockhart, the, the sculpture trail with lures and attracted five. So it's good to know that this wasn't just a one-off sighting, that there is obviously a breeding population here. So, and others went and there were other records in the same general area. So certainly worth looking for again, and something that we'll try and uh, promote next year. Also on the subject of clear wings, current clear wing was found in a Boyne by Harry Scott using a pheromone lure. It was last seen in Northeast Scotland in the 1960s. And that is now one of only two recent Scottish records for uh, current clear wing. And there's Mark Cubitt's photo of uh, the, the uh, white barred clearing. Now, the silver shade, the quest for the silver shade up Glen Tilt, its only known site uh, in Scotland, has continued. Uh, we've managed to extend it, its uh, known range by uh, probably by about 500 metres further up the Glen and further down the Glen. Uh, we were light trapping and we recorded about 20, 25 adults. But what was really, really exciting is that we caught a couple of females and we were able to get the females to lay some eggs. And you see that these eggs are laid in batches. They look like a little bit like lentils. And we've now have just over 100 eggs. They've been split between five people and we're trying to rear them because we don't know what the caterpillars feed on uh, in the wild. Um, and what has happened is that the eggs have all duly hatched and the caterpillars have disappeared. And it seems that they are overwintering as a tiny, tiny caterpillar. And we're hoping that they'll all survive the winter and come out and feed on whatever food plants we supply them in the spring. So that is quite exciting news. Also exciting is this. This is um, a very, very scarce uh, um, Tortrix moth found uh, by Malcolm Lindsay in the borders at Ettrick Marshes. He sent the photo to Mark Young, who got very excited and said it was a fabulously rare moth. It's only previously been seen in Perthshire in 1919, um, and also at this site at Ettrick Marshes by Keith Bland and Teddy Pelham Clinton in 79 and 80. So an incredibly rare moth re-found at this site by Malcolm. The caterpillars feed on willow. And another rare moth, Ethmia pyrausta, um, is known from a, a well, there are old records from the Cairngorms. It was found near Loch Shin, and there's a site near Croik. This was found on the very north coast of Scotland by Susan Kirkup uh, near Skerre on the 28th of April. Another species at the very north of Scotland, this is Carnation tortrix, that's been found now again near Skerry. It's an adventive species that was first recorded in Britain in 1905 on the south coast. So it's taken 117 years for the carnation tortrix to, to spread from the south coast of uh, England all the way up to the north coast of Scotland. This is new to Scotland, found by Richard Weddell, caught in a very small 15 watt heath trap at Hamilton Hill Clay Pits, which despite the name is actually in Glasgow. It was recorded on the 15th of July 
and it is thought that due to the strong southerly winds at the time, it is probably a, an immigrant. The uh, the most the nearest known site is around about uh, you know around about Liverpool. So that was new to Scotland, as was this leopard moth found in Easter Ross. Um, and you'll see there that they overwinter inside the trunks of small trees. So this was in a newly planted hedge. So it's a bit unclear whether the, the moth came uh, was there already or whether it came in with these trees that were that were planted. But it was found by Fer Fergus McKinnon uh, in his, in his uh, front garden in Easter Ross. Another selection of exciting species, uh, knee moth was found on sky. This was new to Scotland as well, recorded by Bog Macmillan on uh, the 22nd of June. I reported last year the very first record of sharp angled carpet, although I kept calling it sharp angled peacock. So the sharp angled carpet was found on Butte last year for the first time in Scotland um, uh, by Ron Forrester. This is a record from Renfrewshire, caught on the 22nd of Ju July by John Sweeney. And it's thought that the probably origins of sharp angle carpet um, are probably from uh, Northern Ireland rather than from Northern England. And Devon carpet, you can see here that it's really confined to uh, Dumfries and Galloway. Well, there are a few records this year. Uh, John Sweeney found it in Renfrewshire and John Wright caught it in the borders in, uh, in Ettrick Valley. So again, a species that seems to be spreading out. And just a wee selection of species here. Uh, just quickly, white satin was uh, recorded by Richard Jackson the, in the borders. The first record, the only record for the, for the borders and for Scotland was, was in 1877. So it's confirmation that it's still there. The same with uh, Nemapogon Nema picarella, which is associated with fungus on trees. Um, it was last recorded in 1951 in the borders, and this was recorded by Barry Prater. Uh, Scallop shell is doing very well. It was found new in um, East Northeast Scotland by Mark Tasker in Bankery, and it also new in the Cairngorms uh, by Mike Taylor in his garden in Boat, uh, uh, yeah, garden in Boat of Garden. Uh, Least yellow underwing, uh, right up in Fair Isle by Nick Ridderford. He was away on holiday. His wife ran the trap, found something unusual, and luckily kept it so that when Nick returned. Shuttle-shaped dart seems to be doing incredibly well in Scotland. Lots of reports of it uh, um, found in new areas, but also becoming more common in areas where it's only recently become established. And Aldermoth, again, a bit like Scallop Shell, is doing very well. Uh, new records up in uh, Malague and Bewley, and also new in East Lothian. So all very, very exciting finds. A few micros here. The top two were new to Scotland, both found in northeast Aberdeenshire, um, as was this one here, Dichroramphra alpinana, which is, well, not new to Scotland, but very few records, but new to northeast Scotland. Uh, one of them was actually found outside by Nick Littlewood outside a public toilet in Johnshaven. And European corn borer, um, possibly the second or the, the first mainland record for Scotland. And a few nights later, one was caught in Dumfries. So again, species that are the new species to Scotland, very exciting. And uh, this is always a great crowd pleaser. This is Clifton Nonpare, otherwise known as the blue underwing. Uh, Nonpare means beyond compare, and it really is a fantastic and super moth. I know that now because I went to twitch one of these. So these are three records from Scotland. It is a fairly irregular immigrant on the East Coast, but these three were all found inland. One of them was caught at Aberfoyl on the 17th of September by Dominic Collins when he was up on holiday. The following night, on the 18th of September, Mark Newell caught one at Stobo in Peeblesshire. And two nights later, on the 20th of September, Peter Stronach caught the third one uh, at Sky of Kerr, which is just north of Aviemore. That's the one that I actually went to Twitch and had to see it in his fridge, but a fantastic moth. But where have these come from? You'd have thought if they were true uh, immigrants from the east, they would be seen up the east coast and there were no Scottish east coast records. This uh, moth is associated with Aspen 
It's now breeding certainly in the south of England and it's thought to be breeding up as far north as Yorkshire. So who knows, are these from that English population? And there's certainly plenty of Aspen, certainly where I am, it will be fantastic if this uh, moth becomes established in Scotland. And you can see here, this is these are all inland records uh, where they were not previously known and the few records that we have from Scotland are predominantly from the east coast. So very exciting. And finally, convolvulus hawk moth, um, a fairly regular migrant that comes arrives in about uh, September, October. It is very, very strongly attracted to nicotiana plants, particularly the sensation mix. And there was a, a large influx, but as always, Roy Leverton uh, saw more than most because he grows huge quantities of uh, nicotiana, particularly to get convolvulus hawk moth. This is his amazing photograph. Um, he had at least six, up to six in view at any one time, and he was able to recognize them as individuals from photographs by the barcoding on the back of their bodies. And he, from that, he said that they had 27, at least 27 different individuals. And also he runs his moth trap very, very regularly. None of them were in his moth trap. So uh, yes, if you want to see this moth, then you have to grow nicotiana. So I think that's me. It's a bit of a rush through. Um, so thanks for listening. Thanks for everybody who sent me information. Thanks for all the photographers. And yeah, apologies if you thought that your news uh, should have been mentioned. Thank you very much, Tom. It's always really nice to round up with people's photographs from the year. It's a great way to end. Uh, do we have any questions for Tom? I've seen there are a couple of comments, Tom, about, about things that might have been missed off, but do we have any questions? I know there was a question before about my wine ropes and uh, my about how old the wine was, how long it lasts, and my wine rope vintage is probably about 10 years old. I keep topping it up every year, so it's fermenting in that big bubbly pot. Fantastic. Um, I can't see any other questions apart from Jim saying that Scotland is clearly the place to go for Lepidoptera, which I'm sure we all agree with. So thank you very much, Tom, for, for finishing the day up with those great records and photographs. So that concludes our talks for today. And I'd like to extend a huge thank you to all of our speakers, staff members, and of course, Anthony as well for organizing the day and making sure the tech all ran smoothly. Thanks also go to Nature Scott for funding the event. Um, and thank you to you for giving up your Saturday morning to come along. I think it's been a really lovely mix today of familiar faces and new volunteers. I particularly enjoyed Colin and Rosemary's talks, reminding us that even if you are really new to BC, you can get involved and really make a difference. I think it's so nice that we can get together for just a few hours and share our passion for butterflies and moths, especially during this very worrying time for nature. So hopefully we've given you a little bit of respite from politics and news headlines and reminded you that there are actually some really fantastic conservation projects going on in Scotland, largely thanks to volunteers like you. So all that's left to say is to wish you an enjoyable remainder of the season and that we look forward to seeing you again in the spring. Thank you very much and goodbye from me.